practical and effective implementation. Another directive to the CAC is to act as a liaison to the community. I'm happy to share that we're doing just that. Each month, PCE staff inform the CAC about and provide high quality, easy to use promo tools for upcoming marketing initiatives, discount and rebate offers, electric home tours, and similar programs that rate payers want to hear about. CAC members share this useful information through word of mouth, social media, and email messages to their wide networks. We're often the first ones to inform surprised community members that PCE exists, that it's providing clean power to San Mateo County and Los Banos residents right now, and working to provide 100% renewable power each and every hour of the day by 2025. It's delightful telling people what PCE is doing for them. The last objective I'll mention is to form working groups to help PCE staff and board with important projects. Right now, four CAC members are signed up for the Home Upgrade Program Working Group, six for building electrification, four for demand side strategies for 24 seven grid decarbonization, two for education initiatives, and four for the role of Citizens Advisory Committee's working group. Most working groups will be digging into their content beginning this month. What questions does anyone have for me? If there are none. If anyone has a question, you can click on the reactions button and raise your hand. And I don't see any hands raised, Cheryl. I don't either. So thank you very much. Okay, great. So the next item on the agenda uh, is approval of the amended, amended and restated power purchase agreement with Arika Solar. And Chelsea Keys will be making this presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you all the board members who are here this evening. We sure have an exciting agenda for you today. And I'm bringing forward to you the first action item. And we're seeking your authorization to amend and restate our power purchase agreement with Erica Solar Plus Storage. So we always like to start with our recommendation and that is to, um, to execute this amended and restated power purchase agreement with our Erica Solar EPA and any other ancillary documents. So first wanted to touch on the background of this project. Um, it's a solar plus storage project. It's called Erica. The developer is with Clearway Energy Group. The technology type, it's 100 megawatt solar and a 50 megawatt four hour storage capacity. The location of this uh, resource is in Riverside County. The expected start date is April 1st, 2024. And we sought your approval of this PPA back on October 26, 2021. And then the photos that I'm sharing with you tonight are courtesy of Clearway of the construction that's happening currently. So we wanted to hit on some of the challenges and disruptions and really the whole purpose of why we're bringing back this agreement for your approval tonight. Um, as many of you are aware, we're kind of in an inflationary market right now. There's very high commodity prices that includes steel, copper, aluminum, many others. Um, there's been a lithium supply scarcity. This is partially um, caused by the EV market driving up demand. There has been changes in interest rates that does impact developers as they seek financing. There's many supply chain, chain disruptions. Still COVID is having impact on these projects. And the precedent before was that the cost of the materials when the developers go to sign these contracts for the materials, those used to be fixed. But now some suppliers are actually finding that they're um, having to sign these contracts where the price floats up until a certain point. So that adds a lot of uncertainty when they're trying to provide a fixed price to us. And then lastly, um, I'll just mention that there is a bit of uncertainty around solar tariffs because those potentially could increase based on, we'll have to see what happens with um, President Biden's um, efforts towards there. And how is this impacting all the buyers in the market? Um, basically what's happening is many developers are having to revisit their executed PPAs for renewable projects that are in development. I mentioned this last time, but PG&E issued an advice letter 
requesting approval of two contract amendments to, P to PPAs with the CPUC. And these are just the amendments and they're examples of the types of challenges that developers are facing and seeking um, to change to make sure that the projects remain economical and on track within their development stages. And while the Inflation Reduction Act, which is you know, a huge thing, it's been great for the development of renewable projects, even you know, as it just happened recently back in August, it does provide some relief, but there is challenges that exist and the costs do remain high for developers. And as many of you are known, <laughs> the CPUC midterm reliability decision that was enacted in June 21st, or sorry, June 24th, 2021. That's the requirement that requires all LSCs collectively to procure 11,500 megawatts of new generation. And there's set in tranches where we have to meet a requirement between the years 2023 and 2026. And the whole purpose behind that is to ensure grid reliability. So when this decision came into effect, it did create a lot of competition in the market. Essentially, all of us load-serving entities must procure to their set requirements in each year between 2023 and 2026. And Erica is an important project to us for not just this reason, but they are um, helping us meet our MTR requirements. So what are the impacts on the project itself? Well, they've been impacted by a combination of challenges, but primarily the supply chain disruption or supply chain disruptions have impacted them directly. The supply scarcity and it's driving up the commodity prices. So while they're going to go contract for solar and storage, it's just higher than what they were predicting. So the developer has come back to PCE requesting changes to particular PPA terms to reduce the possibility of termination. And while it seems like we were just, you know, having this meeting nearly a year ago to execute this PPA, the market has changed considerably and the project's economics have changed drastically. Um, we met with the procurement subcommittee. We held a meeting on July 21st this year, and we relayed all these impacts that we've seen on our projects and the status of our negotiation. And each member of the subcommittee supported our efforts to negotiate amendments to our contracts to alleviate the risk of Erica um, terminating their contract. So what are the impacts to PCE directly? Well, what we did is we conducted an extensive analysis to look at the impacts of what this amended and restated PPA has on our portfolio. And we've determined that these changes are acceptable and reasonable. We believe it would be very difficult to contract for other resources to replace this project because it would be, it's very competitive. And we would be worried that we wouldn't be able to find other projects to meet and achieve the commercial operations under the same timeline as Erica. So this amendment does not impact PCE's midterm reliability requirements. What's good is that Erica will continue to meet our requirement as we had originally planned. So lastly, again, we are seeking your approval to uh, execute the amended and restated power purchase agreement with Erica. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, any questions from members of the board? Uh, Rick Bonilla. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I recall, this project was gonna be built under a PLA. Is that continuing to be the case? Yep, that is the case. Great, thank you. Pradeep. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, just uh, one comment. Uh, I think we, everybody on the board uh, who's keeping up with the news can appreciate the problems with supply chain management and all the other scarcity issues. Uh, my question is, uh, is this the only uh, contractor who has come to us with this request to uh, address the existing PPA or are there any other contractors or any other PPAs maybe facing the same kind of situation? if you are aware of any. Yes, if you might recall from last month's board meeting, we brought the Chaparral Solar Plus Storage PPA to the board. And actually our intent was to bring both of them at the same time because they have very similar you know, circumstances and reasoning behind them. 
And this one just took a little bit longer to negotiate. So that's why we're bringing it to you tonight. But yeah, they're, they're, they're related. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? I don't see any questions. Okay, let me take a public comment. And I have a comment from Dave Morrow. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having this um, retreat uh, on your Erica project by Clearway. That project is being uh, built by a five trade craft agreement. So it does meet your policy 10 uh, requirements. And I think this project is definitely, it's one of, it's, it's a good one and it's done the right way. I don't see a reason why you, you would say no. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Any other public comment? Okay, so I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Rick. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to approve. Okay, great. I, I, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second, Dave, fine. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, does anyone have any other comments before we go on? I just wanna say that uh, I'm on the procurement subcommittee, so I heard the issues and, and I think this is an important contract. And unfortunately, there are a variety of issues which came up to us on Chaparral and exactly the same kinds of issues have come up here and there's no reason to expect that they won't come up elsewhere. So um, we're kind of under the gun in terms of our timing, but that's the market, that's where we're at. And uh, it's an important contract for us. So I, I strongly support uh, board members approving this amendment. Uh, I don't see any other hands. So I assume there's no other comments. Why don't we go into the roll call vote? Thank you. San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Brisbane? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Homa? Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Foster City? Yes. Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro? Uh, I am voting yes, and after this, uh, our board alternate, Vice Mayor Christine Krolik, will be Hillsborough's representative. Thank you. Los Banos? Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. Redwood City? Sorry. San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? And the motion passes, thank you. Okay, great. So that brings us into our retreat agenda. And the first item is a report on our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion policy process. Shana will be making this presentation. Great, just got my video started. Thank you, Jan. Um, so I will be giving a brief update on our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion policy. I'll provide a more robust uh, presentation at our October board meeting. Um, as the board is well aware, we have been working with an external consultant, GCAP Services, for about a year now on our DEAI initiative. We conducted a DEAI needs assessment earlier this year, and we presented the high-level takeaways to the board on that in July. And now we are working on two of the key deliverables, which are a DEAI policy for Peninsula Clean Energy and a DEAI action plan for Peninsula Clean Energy. And so I will be updating you all on the forthcoming policy tonight. As a reminder, uh, here's the DEAI policy origins. Um, Cheryl also mentioned this in her report earlier tonight. The Peninsula Clean Energy Citizens Advisory Committee created an equity working group after the murder of George Floyd in 2020. And they worked for several months to draft a statement on equity and inclusion. They brought that draft statement to the Peninsula Clean Energy Board in January of 2021. The board then formed a subcommittee to direct staff to conduct a solicitation for an equity or DEAI consultant. 
And the original statement drafted by the CAC had these three main elements. Finsa Clean Energy commits to making anti-racism top of mind during decision-making, develop a means of tracking revenue and formulating a mechanism qualitative and quantitative that ensures accountability, pursue equity in energy generation and programs. So I just wanted to provide that background for you all. And now I'll move on to our policy development and stakeholder review process. Our, our consultant GCAP created a draft policy for Peninsula Clean Energy in late July. It used the CAC's equity statement as a foundation and it includes themes from the needs assessment phase of the DEI project, which are the survey and interviews that took place earlier this year and also incorporates industry best practices. After receiving the draft policy, we held three workshops with our stakeholder groups to receive feedback and get buy-in on the draft policy. And these workshops were facilitated by our consultant GCAP and we had them with the following groups. On August 16th, we had um, a workshop with staff. On August 19th, we had a workshop with our board DEAI subcommittee. And on September 8th, we had a workshop with our citizen oh, advisory. What is it? I found a video of him for, for him, his car, his license plate on my phone. I, I think, oh, great. Thank you for whoever muted that. Um, for the third workshop, we had it with our citizens advisory committee, our community-based organizations and a broader community. So that was a public workshop and we made the draft policy publicly available. Um, for the third workshop, um, we promoted the policy, the workshop on social media and conducted outreach to our community partners to invite them to our workshop. We also created a form on our website where community partners and community members could submit written feedback on the policy. Our consultant GCAP took notes on verbal feedback at each workshop and also accepted written feedback after the fact. Um, so we are really happy that we were able to conduct this stakeholder input process on such an important policy. So policy approval uh, is moved to October. It was originally scheduled for approval at, at tonight's board meeting. Um, moving to October allows more time for both the consultant and the internal project team to incorporate feedback from workshops into the final policy. We did recently have that CAC workshop on September 8th and we received some really great workshop, um, some really great feedback there. And so now staff is working with um, the feedback and uh, trying to listen to all of our uh, community stakeholder groups in, um, pre in preparation for the final policy, which will be brought to you guys in October. But I wanted to leave you guys with an excerpt from the um, DEI policy and emphasize that DEAI is of strategic importance to Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, and the uh, excerpt that I'm providing you here says Peninsula Clean Energy commits to making diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion a priority during decision making. So as we make our way through tonight's agenda, I invite you to keep this on your mind and um, as a special consideration um, when you come, may come up with questions or whatnot as we progressed through tonight's agenda. So I, I don't know if any other um, DEI subcommittee members want to comment now, but that concludes my uh, presentation, my brief presentation for tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shana. Uh, are there any questions for Shana? Uh, Rod, and and I, I just want to say, in, in, as Rod is about to speak, that our our DEAI committee really did a lot of work on this, I, and and I, I, I'm glad that you're stepping forward, Rod, because I think it's important for you guys to weigh in on it. I, this is just a report where it's going to really come out in October, but thank you. Oh, thank you, Rick. Um, I no questions, just um, comments. Thank you, Shana. And, you know, this has been a long time coming and, you know, we're taking one step at a time and we're getting there. And I'm just really proud to be part of this process. Um, I think we're creating a historical legacy and precedence for, um, other organizations um, and municipalities in terms of what we're doing here in, in um, PCE. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Rod. Donna. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that I was on a call today with um, Laura Palmer Lohan with the um, County Reach Coalition, and we had an opportunity to hear what the county is doing in their DEAI uh, work. Um, with the with their new uh, person in charge, and so um, after that meeting, I went ahead and developed uh, sent off a an introductory letter to Shana and to Jan, included Laura, so that we could reach out to the county and make sure that we do a little just collaboration check in with them. I think they would really like to come and hear what we're doing and maybe uh, 
you know, listen in on the presentation. Plus, Shana, they may also have a comment or two um, from the work they're doing that would enhance our uh, product and deliverable. So um, it's a wonderful initiative, and I'm excited that we can maybe collaborate a little with them. Maybe you've already been in touch with them, but it's a good group. Thank you for being open-minded and um, for working so hard on this. Thank you. Yeah, definitely willing to connect with Shireen about um, our mutual efforts going forward. So thank you for bringing, we met with her a year ago, but we weren't in the place we are now. So I think it would be great to meet again um, and discuss our efforts and how we can align them. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, okay, great. Thank you both Donna and Rod. Are there any other comments or questions from members of the board? And is there any public comment on this issue? I don't see any hands raised. So let's move on. Uh, the next item is the strategic plan dashboard update. Okay. Well, now we're getting into the real meat of our retreat, which is to get into the strategic plan and then to focus on our key strategic priorities. So if we could have the, the next slide, please. Um, as, as you all know, we have an amazing team here at Peninsula Clean Energy. And even though we've been working entirely remotely for the last two and a half years, we have continued to make great progress on our strategic goals. And so tonight we're gonna be uh, giving our third annual update. Uh, this was adopted in 2020. We gave you an, an overview in September of 21. Last year, we gave you an annual update. This is a, our next annual update, and we do semi-annual updates to the executive committee in April. Um, in the board memo for this topic, we provided a lot of detail for each part of the organization. And tonight we will just be providing some highlights. Um, I will start and then each director will review the status on their dashboards, the key accomplishments for the last year, uh, summer fiscal year, summer calendar year, and then the priorities for 2023. And then following your feedback that you provided last year, we have included color-coded uh, color uh, dashboard updates so that you can quickly see how we're doing in each of our key performance areas. Um, next slide, please. So some of the changes since last September, uh, you may recall that there was a request to look at moving the 2045 decarb goal to 2035. So what we will be presenting tonight is how we can meet the, how we could meet a 2035 goal. And we've also focused on uh, personal vehicle transportation and small residential building electrification, which are the areas that we focus on. We've also separated out the account services part of the dashboard, which had previously been part of marketing and community relations. Um, the 2025 targets for community en energy programs reflect the current and more realistic market conditions going forward. And then in the April update that we did earlier this year, the power resources team reorganized their objectives. So tonight's report out will be based on those uh, reorganized objectives for that team. Next, please. And as you all know, and as has already been noted by Chelsea, um, costs are still high for a lot of commodities in the market. Um, although we're seeing some easement of some material costs, when we look at vehicle costs, those still remain very high. So as we try to transition people over to electric vehicles, um, you know, we're, we're figuring out how we can do that. Um, there are still worker shortages, um, const construction employment um, exceeds pre-pandemic levels or the need for construction. And we know how much construction has gone up in costs. And then for building electrification, we'll be getting into this in more detail in the presentation, but utility costs are high and there's low awareness and motivation for people to electrify their buildings. So these are the things that we're 
we're grappling with, and we will be getting into all that in more detail as we go along. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, for our overall two key organizational priorities, the first one is to meet, uh, provide 100% renewable energy on a 24 seven basis by 2025. And we are rapidly working towards that target and you'll get a lot more information about that tonight. But when we look at just how we've been meeting our, our goal for renewable energy in general, um, we're predicting in 2022 to be delivering 53.6% renewables um, as we move towards that 2025 target. And then for the 2035 decarbonization target, we have continually been increasing the amount of GHGs reduced in, the, in our service area. And you'll be getting a lot more information about that when we get to that section as well this evening. So I'll turn it over to each of the directors who are gonna be reporting out on their areas. And the first one is Power Resources. I'll turn that over to Chelsea, who's um, serving as our interim director for Power Resources. Thank you, Jan. Yes, I will start with the Power Resources overview. So this just shows our key performance indicators and we do measure this on a calendar year basis. And like the previous slide, we set 2019 as the baseline. We separated our Eco Plus from Eco 100. And if you can look at the table here, you'll see that Eco Plus for our annual renewable content. We, are, we have a year to date figure for 2022. So that is subject to change, but we are on target um, in every year. And then our 2025 target is 100%. And then for our annual renewable content for Eco 100, you can see that we're 100% because that is our goal. And we do not have an emissions factor associated with that. And then at the bottom here, you have the new Peninsula Clean Energy Capacity statewide. And this is the percentage of loads served by our new resources. So you can see that from 2020, we have increased. And this is based upon the, the resources that we have commercially operate, uh, operating as of today. And our target in 2025 is to reach 50%. Next slide. So we wanted to highlight some of our key accomplishments for the fiscal year 2022. As many of you saw, we published the part one of our 24-7 white paper, which was very exciting. We're continuing to progress our 24-7 strategy and we finalized the model and we're really excited to go into those details this evening. And then lastly, we executed several PPAs. Despite the market and its challenges and everything going on, we, we executed Chaparral and Erica, Gonzaga Ridge Wind, Geysers Geothermal, Second Imperial Geothermal, which we sometimes refer to as Heber 2. And then we participated in three PPAs with CC Power, and this includes Tumbleweed, a long duration storage project, uh, Fish Lake Geothermal, and an Ormat Geothermal portfolio. So a lot of success. Next slide. And then some of our fiscal year 2023 upcoming key priorities on our team are we're going to uh, publish, publish part two of our 24-7 white paper. We do plan on issuing multiple requests for proposals for renewable energy and storage resources, and we will then pursue to negotiate and execute the contracts for our 24-7 goal and additionally meet our CPUC midterm reliability obligations. And that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. We'll turn it over to Rafael to talk about community energy programs. Thank you, directors. Um, like Power Resources, the, the Community Energy Programs dashboard is also on a calendar year basis. Uh, and in the case of 2022, it's a six month uh, time frame. The first two lines are our emissions reductions that will continue on an annual basis based on all outcomes that we have uh, 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 delivered to date uh, for each of those time frames. Uh, it is growing. Uh, largely on the basis of the REACH codes. Um, however, in future years, we see the other programs playing a larger role over time. The next two lines with EV charging ports installed in electric appliances, primarily water heaters. Um, both of these programs started at the beginning, essentially the beginning of 2021. Uh, as previously discussed, uh, we've had significant issues around supply chain and pandemic challenges. Those are ongoing. Our yield to date um, remains uh, modest. 
Um, although in EV charging, we have a very robust uh, pipeline of ports um, with over 3,000 uh, ports in the pipeline. There will be um, uh, adds and removes to, to that number, but we do um, have uh, high confidence uh, in that pipeline overall. On local resources, uh, we are still undershooting the targets, um, but the local government uh, solar program will play a significant role and will be coming online uh, soon. Uh, as noted earlier, our targets, uh, we have revised our targets down. Um, the targets were originally developed in early 2020 before we had a good understanding of the pandemic effects. We believe these new targets are both uh, aggressive but achievable uh, and are looking forward to, to meeting them. Next slide. Key accomplishments uh, to date, as noted earlier, not only do we have the 3,000 char charging ports in our pipeline, we have uh, sig made significant recent changes to the program uh, uh, to address a number of challenges, and we are already seeing improved uptake uh, in the program. And so we are uh, uh, optimistic that these changes will um, lead us down the right path. On reach codes, as most directors are aware, this has been extremely successful to date. Uh, and we have moved into the 2022 cycle and rolled out new model codes, including existing building uh, codes and a number of cities are, are already in progress uh, on the new uh, reach code. So thank you. And then on the local government solar program, the pilot phase, which has a novel um, uh, uh, model, a uh, business model as part of it, we have completed the solicitation and are moving into contracting. And so excited about that. Next slide. Priorities, uh, installation of EV charging, our number one priority to get those uh, ports installed. Uh, on buildings, um, we have a number of major updates coming to the buildings program, an interim update coming in, in October, and then a much broader um, overall program update uh, coming next year. Uh, existing building codes, also a top priority as part of the building programs overall. We'll be talking more about that later. And then on distributed resources, the local government solar will be the primary driver to meeting the local uh, resources uh, objectives and our VPP power plant uh, programs uh, will start to come online over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, we'll now move to KJ to talk about the marketing and community relations. Good evening, directors and members of the public. Uh, here is our dashboard and looking at these colors, it strikes me that I'm a hard grader. Um, the overall participation rate is a metric that we share with account services. And for the entire territory, this remains steady at a, at a very high 97%. And that includes participation to date from Los Banos. We saw a nice increase in total aided awareness in fiscal year 2022. This 8% increase over the previous year is heartening after several years of no movement in that measure. And if we had an 8% increase each year for the next three years, we would exceed the target of 60% by 2025. However, I have rated the 2025 goal as at risk because we cannot count on having this sort of an increase every year. And this will require amped up impressions through paid as well as owned and earned media channels. The favorability ratings uh, dropped a bit between 2021 and 2022. Half of this drop was due to more respondents choosing not sure on the survey. This is not headed in the right direction, but this is rated yellow, not red, since it is off target by a somewhat smaller percentage than the aided awareness metric. Engagement with residential and small and medium business customers is another metric that we share with account services and we rate this as medium to low. We believe our engagement with residential customers is improving based upon measures such as email open rates, visits to our website, participation in webinars, and uptake of incentives. However, the portion of our residential customers who do engage with us leaves plenty of upside. The SMB segment is very difficult to reach and we currently have little direct programmatic support for that segment. Next slide, please. Key accomplishments for the 2022 fiscal year include the Los Banos enrollment with a strong participation rate estimated at 95% at this point in the ongoing enrollment and generally positive perceptions. 
our electrification awareness program, including the all electric awards, new original content, well attended webinars and progress on the electrification benefits campaign development are also key accomplishments. And our outreach grantee program, which in calendar year 2022 included grants to 12 community based organizations continues to be a source of strength in reaching diverse, sometimes hard to reach parts of our community, often in languages other than English. Next slide, please. For the current fiscal year, our biggest program launch is the 0% loan program, coupled with expanded rebates for heat pump appliances. Improving Peninsula Clean Energy awareness and favorability is a high priority, and that will be supported in part through our electrification benefits campaign. And the calendar year 2023 outreach grant program has just opened for proposals and will be undergoing a rigorous evaluation process in order to fund grantees starting in January of 2023 for the 2023 calendar year. Thank you, KJ. Uh, we'll now turn to Leslie to uh, fill us in on account services. Hi, um, I, uh, I'm going to start with the customer data and analytics, um, and as which is a new uh, category for us to be tracking here. Um, this is a measure of our increase increasing our ability to help our customers get access to their energy data, and improving tools for them to understand their energy usage and make decisions about what types of projects or programs they may be able to participate in to help forward our larger goals with uh, decarbonization. Um, we did not have a lot of um, ability to do that previously beyond what was just sort of the basic general Excel reports that we would get. Um, but this last year, we launched a tool called Data Connect um, in partnership with a company called Utility API um, that's giving a direct portal access to right now just our, a few of our largest strategic accounts to get a um, combined data stream of all of their energy usage and cost information um, in one data stream, which is a, a really huge benefit. Um, the folks that are using that tool right now are really grateful for it. Um, and so we, we've just launched that and we're looking to expand on that um, further. Um, our next category here with external partner relations. Um, this is our partnerships with both our uh, operational partners like PG&E and uh, Calpine Energy Services, who we need to maintain really excellent operational relationships with in order to do business, but also our um, relationships with other um, CCAs. Um, we've been doing a, a lot of external outreach and coordination um, with those agencies over the past several years. And I'm giving ourselves a very high rating on that. We're very well respected um, by all of our external partners um, in all fronts. In our key, key, key account engagement, um, it has been quite low um, historically. Um, we're starting to move up a little bit into that medium um, category. And I've categorized that uh, mostly with our up increase in our tools for those customers to have more engagement, we also this last year signed another customer to a uh, long-term agreement. Um, and we're looking forward, uh, going forward to do a lot more engagement with that this group now that we're starting to come out of the uncertainty from the COVID years. Can go to the, uh, the next slide. Um, so one of our, our biggest key accomplishments this year, like I mentioned previously, was launching the Data Connect platform. Um, this has received a, you know, a really great uh, reception from our customers that are using it. Um, we're also using the Data Connect platform to assist with our programs team and helping to get um, more streamlined data uh, for our customers that are participating in our EV Ready program and the um, uh, the uh, the low the low income uh, home rehab program. We had a very successful time of use uh, transition in September of 21 this last year. This was a multi-year project, about a three-year project that we worked on with PG&E and all of the other uh, CCAs in PG&E's territory to coordinate a very complicated transition for uh, overall several million customers um, in our service territory. Uh, we had, uh, about, I think, about 100, 120,000 customers that transitioned over into um, this rate, not every 
a residential customer was eligible. Um, but of the customers that were eligible for the automatic transition, we had about a 70% participation rate, which was on the high end for the other CCAs. And then also last year, we had a, an opportunity to um, recover some funds from the state in the uh, CAP, the California Ridge uh, uh, program to for customers that received um, uh, some debt relief. It was an unexpected opportunity for us, but participating in that uh, process with the state and with pg and &E and our data management partner, Calpine, recovered 1.8 million funds for our customers to uh, offset some of the debts that they occurred during the COVID timeframes. Next slide. This next year, we're looking forward to um, re-engaging with our strategic accounts. We're close to hiring a new strategic accounts manager. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, really relaunching that effort to uh, reach out to those customers and re-engage them in promoting some new opportunities with our programs and PCE's broader decarbonization goals. Um, where we're also about to launch some expanded uh, data connect functionalities. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got the uh, electric energy oh, yeah. usage and cost data yes. in there. We're working on adding gas data as well, mm -hmm. which would really be a game changer, having all of the electric usage and gas usage available in that tool. And then we want to expand um, access to beyond our strategic accounts um, later this year to uh, other customers as well. And we're also doing a lot of thinking about the eventual um, NEM 3.0 decision that is coming out from the CPUC. This has been uh, sort of a hold, wait and see, um, but we're pretty confident that this is going to be coming down um, in the next few months, which is going to, you know, create a lot of like uncertainty for our customers um, and, and for folks that are transitioning into NEM 3.0, both new customers who are going to be installing solar systems, but also the legacy customers that are going to be transitioning from their NEM 1.0 and NEM 2.0 contracts um, to a NEM 3.0 um, universe. Uh, I think there's going to be a role for us to play there and helping our customers understand what their options are, but then also making sure that we're supporting them um, and helping them to continue to install solar and storage um, and operate uh, under the new rules. Thank you, Leslie. We will now move on to our public policy update uh, from Jeremy and Mark. I don't know if you guys are doing this together. Yeah, good evening, members of the board. I'm going to start off. Um, Director Hirschman and I get to share our four minutes of fame with you. So I'm going to be pretty quick as we go through these three slides, and then he will follow up with a address to his items. So looking at the items that have changed here, PCIA containment, the main driver that has moved that to a more favorable position has been the high gas prices that we've all been experiencing in the market. That has actually provided some PCIA rate relief because it collects above market costs. And since market costs have risen, there are fewer above market costs to recover. Our coalition building has improved with time. We engage with many more stakeholders outside of the immediate CCA sphere in both regulatory and legislative spaces. And we have done so to um, productive effect, which Mark will speak to more. And then in terms of uh, growth, fostering growth, we have had a smooth enrollment of Los Banos, and a lot of that credit goes to organization-wide efforts. Um, but there was some key work done by the policy group to ensure that some of our low-income customers in Los Banos were able to uh, continue their discounted service as we stepped in as their load-serving entity. So next slide. So as far as some of the accomplishments within the year, I'll just speak to the regulatory items. In addition to the PCIA rates going down because of market conditions, there's continued efforts to reform the PCIA. Most notably, there was a recent ruling from the commission contemplating a greenhouse gas adder as part of the benchmark methodology, which would help to further lower PCIA costs for customers. Uh, additionally, at the tail end of last year, we submitted an election to administer funds to the uh, Public Utilities Commission to fund our flex market program. That was granted in May of this year and allowed for a bit of a soft launch of that program during the September heat wave that we just experienced. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier with Los Banos, we were su successful in being able to negotiate a uh, transfer of capacity in that program so that our Los Banos low income customers would not have a dis disruption in the discounts that they're receiving under that program. And then last slide, 
going forwards. Um, we will be focusing on, uh, to speak to something Raphael spoke to, exploring ways to lower rates to further encourage electrification. Um, we, there's been a lot of sweeping changes in this last legislative cycle that impact the state's reliability efforts and resource mix. And so there will be a lot of follow on regulation work to uh, navigate all those changes. And then finally, there is a lot of state and federal funding opening up. And so we, we will be quite aggressively pursuing avenues to help fund our programmatic efforts. And Mark? Thank you, Jeremy, and good evening, board members. I'd um, like to share a very brief overview of some of the 2022 legislative highlights, uh, bolstered by strong support from local elected officials and communities. Our voice was heard uh, in Sacramento and within uh, Cal CCA. And I'd like to spotlight uh, two bills that were mentioned. Um, one is AB 1814. This was Cal CCA's legislative initiative for 2022. It would have provided explicit legislative authority for CCAs to administer funds collected from ratepayers in our service area and for the purpose of developing electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, thank you to the many Peninsula communities that sent letters of support and uh, Senators Becker and Wiener and Assemblymember Mullen in our area quickly signed on as co-authors of the bill. Unfortunately, a uh, few legislators from other parts of the state joined the support of Peninsula delegation and the bill died without receiving a hearing. Uh, another area, a uh, bill that was of significance to us was SB 1158. This pro would provide transparency of load serving entities progress towards meeting their GHG reduction targets. And this bill was just signed into law last week. Um, it reflects Peninsula Clean Energy's 24 seven goals, it was authored by Senator Becker and he has acknowledged uh, Peninsula Clean Energy's leadership on this issue. Uh, we were able to work with the author to address some of the concerns expressed by members of the CCA community and Peninsula Clean Energy provided lead testimony at two committee hearings on the bill. Uh, we also had success in defeating legislative initiatives which on which we took an opposed position. Uh, for instance, uh, SB 1393 would have added layers of bureaucracy and delay for local governments seeking to enact reach codes and SB 1287 which would have increased the current CCA financial security requirements. Uh, in the coming year, we see challenges and opportunities. Uh, there is going to be a significant turnover in office holders throughout the state, both at the local level and including members of the assembly and Congress representing the peninsula and Los Banos. And finally, uh, as indicated, our expansion efforts in Merced County were buoyed by the successful enrollment in Los Banos, and we look forward to moving ahead uh, with our relationships in the Central Valley in the coming year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark and Jeremy. We'll now move to Christina for the financial overview. Thanks, Jim. Um, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, on the financial stewardship overview, uh, we have our key performance indicators uh, measured on a fiscal year basis. Um, as you can see, all of the key performance indicators were tracking uh, green and on target uh, to our 2025 target. Um, the uh, items are days cash on hand where we had uh, 201 days cash on hand at the end of fiscal year 22, um, more than our minimum of 180 days um, and on target to our 231 um, targeted in 2025. Um, our credit ratings with uh, Fitch and Moody's, we currently have a triple B plus rating with Fitch and a BAA2 positive with Moody's, um, grading on target towards our 2025 target where we're targeting a single A level rating. Um, there's a discrepancy from the um, uh, board memo of, that you received on this particular item. It was just coded incorrectly. Um, on the third item here, our change in net position, how did we do at the end of fiscal year end uh, 22? Um, you can see that we have a negative $12.9 million change in net position, so a loss. Uh, but one of the things to highlight is that is a better than budget uh, performance in fiscal year end 22, and definitely on target to a positive uh, net position um, by 2025. Our investment performance, we have not yet established what a target uh, should be. Um, and the, the negative performance in fiscal year 22 reflects um, a couple different things, just 
the volatility of the markets, um, if you recall what things were like since uh, January through June, um, pretty tremendous uh, volatility in the markets, uh, which affected our investment performance, as well as need to dip into our um, investments um, to cover our negative net position. Um, An average cost of energy uh, tracking at $62.75 uh, at the end of fiscal year in 22, um, also on target to our 2025 target. Um, let's go to the next slide, which gives uh, highlights on key accomplishments. Um, the first one is uh, in June of 2020, May or June of 2022, Moody's Investor Service assigned a positive outlook on um, PCE's credit rating. So definitely a positive uh, in terms of uh, movement towards an upgrade uh, rating action with Moody's Investor Service. The second key accomplishment um, that I'd like to highlight is that despite the significant power market volatility in fiscal year 22, um, our change in that position while negative um, reflected better than budget performance. So we ended dipping into reserves about uh, $12.9 million our budget for fiscal year 22 had us um, expecting to dip into reserves by $18 million. So we performed better than budget by about $6 million. Um, number three, the uh, actual average cost of energy in fiscal year 2021, um, and as well as fiscal year 22 was better than what we were initially projecting. Again, uh, just looking at our prudent financial management. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, key priorities for finance in fiscal year 23. Uh, one, really continuing to push to obtain uh, Peninsula Clean Energy rating upgrades with the credit rating agencies. Um, and two, continue the prudent and close financial tracking and management of expenditures to ensure that we maintain a healthy and strong uh, liquidity position. And that's all that I have for finance. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. And I will quickly go over the next section, which is our organizational excellence. Um, we feel that we're on target for most of our key performance indicators, staff satisfaction uh, based on surveys of our staff, innovation impact in terms of the work that we're doing on our 24 seven and looking and, and our 2035 decarb work. Um, we implemented a number of technologies and systems this last year. We we're on target for our organizational policies, especially with the work we're doing in the DEAI area. And then on the governance area, um, as we look at changes to the composition of the board and incorporating the DEAI policy, we're keeping an eye on, on making sure that we keep our eye on the ball for all of this. If we look at our key accomplishments on our next slide, uh, in this last fiscal year, we hired a new board clerk. We hired a COO, Sean Marshall, board clerk, Nelly Wagberg. We hired a new CFO, Christina uh, Cordera, and we hired a director of HR, Cora Dino. So we filled some key positions um, that were part of our goal for this year. Um, you heard from Shana about the DEAI work that we're doing. And um, she is leading uh, this project in a, in a great way, as are many other members of our team. And uh, we're committed to really doing an excellent job here and working with all of you on the board. Um, Kim Lee in our IT department has been working diligently on our data warehouse. So we have much more capabilities in-house for analysis and doing automations. And then, during this last year, we've, we haven't seen each other live, have we? But we have successfully navigated uh, these Zoom meetings with you, with our um, executive and audit and finance committees, and with the CAC meetings, and um, have seen great attendance. So we appreciate you sticking to it and uh, coming to these meetings and your continued excellent engagement. For the next year, our priorities are to implement the DEAA policy and the action plan uh, to strengthen our training and professional development opportunities for our staff and to strengthen the communication and onboarding support 
with existing board members and for those many new board members and alternates that we anticipate joining the board. So that pretty much wraps up our dashboard. We can stop here for any questions that you might have, and then we'll take a five minute break before we go on. And, and as you can see, we've got an awesome staff. Um, we're, they're, everyone's doing excellent work and we're just so excited to be continuing to be so productive um, while we work remotely. It's working. Great. Great. Any questions? I mean, this is a pretty big presentation and, and let's face it, this is our annual retreat. So th this is kind of the review of the year. So you're going to see big presentations and um, that was a lot of information, but uh, any questions from members of the board regarding uh, any of the items that came up? Pradeep. Just a very uh, small uh, question, uh, brief question, Jan. Uh, excellent report, a uh, lot of progress in all areas. Congratulations to the staff for doing a great job. My only uh, question was that I didn't hear anything about a study that you and your staff are taking about looking at possibility of cost-based rate making for PCE. Uh, is that been laid out on the wayside or is it still continuing? What is the, what is the progress on that aspect? Um, thank you, Pradeep, for, for pointing that out. That probably should have been there as a priority for, for 2023. It is on our list of, of things to do. So uh, apologize for leaving that out. And actually, I want to do a big shout out to Sean Marshall, who actually made this whole presentation of our strategic plan and our, our update um, happen for you. She, she led the team in getting the memo together and getting these slides together tonight. So uh, she's sitting here quietly observing, but she's the, the work behind this report tonight as well as all of the, all of the teams. And may I pop in on um, the comment that Pradeep made, just Christina? Please. Um, in in the board memo, in the details on organizational excellence, uh, I believe there is the, the, the identification of the cost of service, um, uh, the want to engage in our uh, cost of service study. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, let's take public comment. Uh, I, first, Drew. Hello oh, there. Just sorry, sorry, Drew. I I, I missed. I, I yes. had a prior comment from Bruce Carney. So let Bruce go first, and then you can follow Drew. Thank you very much, um, board and staff. One of the concerns from a strategic perspective is the necessary process simplification uh, to deal with the vast volume of building retrofits and EV charging systems that will need to be installed throughout PCE territory. Just back of the envelope calculations, a home might require five electric appliances to replace five gas appliances. And if each of those requires a permit and an inspection, that would be a million permits and a million inspections on the way to complete decarbonization of your service territory. You know, how can that be accomplished? I think that thinking long and hard about process simplification replacing 100% inspection with some statistical inspection, and possibly having PCE be the employer of a uh, floating cadre of inspectors who are perhaps not trained to inspect every aspect of a building system, but focusing on the five or six different kinds of technology that need to happen in building decarbonization could save the individual cities a lot of time, money, and budget hassles. So I hope you'll add a uh, building permit and building inspection process simplification to your short-term strategic list of tasks to get out ahead of the tsunami of uh, electrification projects that will be taking place over the next five to 15 years. Okay, uh, thank you, Bruce. Drew. Good evening there. Just uh, one quick, a lot of good info in this presentation. Appreciate it all. And 
we'll keep on one just only one question was I may have missed it, but the days on hand of I think it's cash went from two hundred fifty seven to two oh one. And I may have missed the explanation a little bit along the way. I've kind of watched this over the last year. And I don't mean in detail, but just vaguely kind of been watching. And I'm just wondering a little bit. I'm not not afraid that that number went down, but just a little bit why that dropped that much, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to address that. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty simple calculation of how much cash do you have over your uh, expenditures. Um, uh, times 365 days and um, uh, expenditures were it's expenditure increases in fiscal year 22 were pretty significant. So um, while uh, cash um, still is very healthy, um, we weathered pretty significant um, expenditure increases. Okay. Trying to unmute. Thank you, Christina. Uh, <clears throat> are there any other public comments? Okay, I don't see anyone else's hand up. If members of the board would like to make comments, this is now the right time. And and I'll make one comment. You know, Jan, as, as I look through all of the material that was presented, and it's a lot of material, and there's a lot of different areas to focus on. So thank you, Sean, for pulling all of that together. Uh, the one item that totally jumps out at me as a wild success is how successful we were in Los Banos. It's amazing that we only had a 3% opt-out rate. We thought we had a 2.5% or 2% opt-out rate in San Mateo County because PG&E had screwed up so badly in Los Banos. And San Mateo County hated PG&E so much that we were the only people that would opt out in San Mateo County were people that were employed by PG&E. But here we go into Los Banos, which is a totally different territory, and we knocked the ball out of the park. We, I mean, it's an incredible success that we only had a 3% opt-out rate in Los Banos. We, we have to give ourselves enormous credit for that, and it shows that there's an opportunity that we need to be able to focus on with this Central Valley. And, and that's not to say that we should grow. I don't care about whether PCE grows or not, but there's a need in the Central Valley. We only had an opt-out rate of 3% in Los Banos. That's a really big deal. I, there, there's a lot of information presented over the last year in terms of our strategic focus. And you know we can discuss different issues. And, and I think that Pradeep's uh, focus on the rates issue is a very important focus. But I've got to say, we absolutely hit the ball out of the park in Los Manos. I give enormous credit to the staff and to our representative in Los Manos for making that so successful. That was really excellent. And I'm looking for any other comments that other board members may have. Uh, Chair DeGolia, could I interject a comment here? Please, go ahead, KJ. So um, I, I wanna make sure that my statement of the 97% participation rate was not uh, misinterpreted. Um, the 97% participation rate is for our whole territory all combined together. So far, the estimated participation rate in Los Banos is 95%. When you blend it together, since it's a small community, it comes out to 97. And, and also, I, I just want to make sure that we're not done enrolling in Los Banos, and we may see some more opt-outs. So I, I just want to make sure we don't set our, our bar so high that we come in and, and look like we failed at that. So just to be clear. Yeah, but, but we expected a 15% opt-out rate. So to, that was to our come goal. in yeah. at 5% at this point is a, totally a home run. Yes, and absolutely. Leslie and Jan and, and everyone on the team deserve credit for that. Okay, I, I don't see any other comments, so let's move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda is 
uh, an update on the discussion on 100% renewable on a 24-7 basis by 2025. And actually, we promised you all a five-minute break here because uh, this is going to be a long okay. presentation. So Very my good. clock says 6.48. So uh, can we start at 6.53? Great. Okay. okay. We'll see you at 6.53. Okay.
Okay, I think that's the end of the five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> can we move on to the update and discussion of the first strategic goal? Thank you, I'll, I'll get us started on this. Um, we're doing an update and discussion on the 100% renewable goal by 24 seven on a 24 seven basis by 2025. So if we can go to the next slide, what we'll be reviewing tonight, uh, first providing an introduction and recommendation, I'll do that. Um, Sarah Mata will then do the background. Uh, Greg Miller will provide an overview on the modeling approach. The results will be shared by Mehdi Shariari and Sarah. Uh, as well as the challenges and risks, and then a summary and recommendation again at the end. And I just want to note, um, as you'll see tonight, we have an amazing team that has been working on this project. Um, every single member of our power resources team is awesome. And the people that you'll be hearing from tonight who've done, been doing uh, the 99.9% .9 of the work on this project are Greg, Sarah, and Mehdi. So Greg Miller joined us a couple of years ago as an intern. He's uh, about to finish up his PhD at UC Davis. And he's he'll be talking about the model that he, he was working on for us. Um, Sarah and Mehdi have been doing a lot of the additional modeling work. Uh, Mehdi in particular was the stochastic modeling and um, Sarah, a lot of the analysis. So um, this is groundbreaking work that we are doing. Other corporations like uh, Google and Microsoft are looking to do similarly for their organizations, but Peninsula Clean Energy is far ahead in terms of the timing that we're aiming for and the extensive modeling and studying that we've been doing. And as Mark noted, our local state Senator Josh Becker shares our view that 24 seven is the wave of the future and he successfully introduced SB 1158, which the governor signed last week. And we provided testimony at hearings in Sacramento to support this work. So the results that we're gonna report out to you tonight are very promising. We're very excited to be leading the way to a cleaner and more sustainable world. And we hope that others will follow us um, in this path forward. So if we go to the next slide, um, and we'll go to the next one. Okay, so as you know, our two top organizational priorities, this is one of them to deliver 100% renewable each and every hour of the day by 2025. And I wanna note that some terminology that we'll be using tonight, that we're gonna use the terms 24 seven, time coincident and hourly, all of that is kind of the same thing. So those will be used interchangeably as we refer to this goal. Why do we have this goal? So we currently deliver 100% clean electricity to our customers, 50% renewable, and we've built a financially strong organization. We have been providing clean energy at lower cost to all of our customers, 5% savings since we started. We've saved our customers over $100 million over the last six years. And our goal is to match our supply to our load on an hourly basis so that we don't send any demand signals to the grid for methane gas. And that can help us continue to reduce our GHG emissions for providing electricity to our customers for however they might use it. And as we get them into electric vehicles and all electric homes. So we wanna show that it's possible to do this in a cost-effective way. And we're gonna show you tonight that we can. The progress to date in this goal, we started this in 2016 with a 100% renewable goal when we first launched. Um, we set the 24 seven goal in 2017. Um, we've been procuring power since the beginning. And then we began the modeling development in 2020 with our 24 seven planning model. We published the white paper in December of 2021 explaining why we were doing it. This last year, our team has been doing extensive model development. We've had updates with uh, the um, subcommittee and with our external advisory group. And 
um, we've finished, we're pretty much finished on the modeling and if we go to the next slide, we're very encouraged to be recommending tonight that we target 99% time coincident renewable energy on a planning forecast basis. 100% is very expensive, we'll get into that, but we believe we can do 99%. When you, when you round 99%, that gets you to 100% and that we can do this and still be saving our customers money. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Sarah who will um, start on the background and then you'll hear from uh, Greg and Mehdi uh, during the course of this presentation. And there will be opportunities uh, for you to ask questions and to provide your comments. Great, thanks so much, Jan. Hi, everyone. Good evening, my name is Sarah Mata. I'm a senior analyst on the Power Resources team. And I'll be reviewing a little bit of background to talk about what is this goal? Why is it important? Um, and these slides are hopefully familiar. We reviewed very similar slides at last year's retreat. So as Jan mentioned, we're currently supplying our customers entirely energy that is from carbon-free or renewable resources on a total annual basis. So that means every year we purchase enough renewable or carbon-free energy to match the total amount of our customers' demand over the course of one year. And the chart on the right is showing that comparison for 2021. Um, so this annual accounting framework is the current industry standard. Um, however, it doesn't give us any indication of whether the energy that we're supplying to our customers matches what our customers are actually using each individual hour of the year. Um, so next slide, please. So we do an analysis of each hour of the year to see how much energy we are actually supplying our customers and how much is the residual that needs to be made up from generic grid energy. Um, and the results of this analysis for 2021 are shown here in this heat map. So this heat map, every row is an hour of the day and every um, column is a day of the year. So they're showing each hour is a pixel in this graph. We're showing all 8,760 hours of 2021 here. And they're color coded by how much grid emissions was associated with our use of energy from the grid in 2021. Um, green uh, pixels indicate that we entirely supplied all of our customers' energy needs with our own resources. And the red colors show that we had to rely on grid energy and there were emissions associated with use of grid energy in that hour. Um, so you can see uh, in the middle of the graph where there's lots of green, that's um, the middle of the day during the summer, the sun is shining, there's plenty of solar energy. And the corners of this graph, the red corners represent overnight hours in the winter um, when there's not a lot of sun and our customers still need some energy. So our vision for 24 seven renewable energy is that every pixel on this graphic is green by 2025. And if we do that, as Jan mentioned, we will no longer be sending a market signal to the grid that our customers need to use gas overnight. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick comparison of the annual accounting framework versus the 24 seven or hourly or time coincident accounting framework. Um, these two calculations result in very different uh, numbers to talk about your emissions footprint. Um, and we believe that the 24 seven accounting approach is necessary to understand the signals we're sending to the market about the use of gas energy and also how to reduce the need for gas energy on the grid every hour of the day. So in the table on the right, we're showing the emissions footprint. When you use an annual accounting framework, this number is hopefully familiar. This is the current reporting standard that we use in the power content label. Um, so by this standard, we are supplying five pounds per megawatt hour five pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour in the energy that we serve our customers. On the left is the 24 seven accounting framework, um, which is reflective of the SB 1158 that we've mentioned. Um, this accounting framework is the way of the future. Um, with the adoption of SB 1158, the power content label will likely be moving to this accounting framework in the next five to six years. Um, and you can see this accounting framework tells a different story. It says that we still have a ways to go to reduce the need for gas on the grid. Next slide, please. And the last piece of background I wanted to provide 
is this um, reminder from last year's retreat, how we're talking about phasing our goal. So we're currently talking about using a planning forecast to um, procure renewable energy on a 24 seven basis. Um, and this is an, uh, as opposed to using real time data, which there are still some data delays in uh, us getting our data from our customers meters and also our renewable uh, power plants that will make it difficult to use real time data in the near term. But our second phase of our goal is to improve our data pipelines so that we can be using real time data to make our um, renewable energy uh, generations on the grid. And we're going to show a little bit of a comparison between these two types of approaches in the results section later. So there will be more information on this. And uh, if there's any questions, we can discuss them now or we can get into the modeling approach with Greg. If anyone has a question, uh, please hit the reactions button so that your hand is raised. I don't, I don't see any questions at this point. Okay. Um, thanks, Sarah. Um, so my name is Greg Miller. Um, as Jan mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis and I've been working um, with Power Resources team at PCE um, for the last two years um, to develop a, a new modeling approach to plan this 24-7 goal. Uh, when we started on this, there wasn't really an existing modeling tool that existed to help, uh, help us understand what would be a cost-effective way to achieve this um, time coincident target just because it's, you know, we were leading on this. And so um, what we've done over the last couple of years is develop this new model, uh, which we've called the match model um, to identify the least cost portfolio of um, renewable generation resources and storage resources that can meet our load in every hour, um, considering factors um, such as, you know, what resources are available to us, um, their costs and any other uh, regulatory constraints that we face. So next slide. Um, so I wanted to introduce a little bit of modeling terminology and I won't get too in the weeds here, but basically there's two different types of models and the match model that we've developed is what's called a deterministic model. And essentially all that means is that if you put uh, the same inputs into the model, you'll get the same outputs out of the model every time. Um, so this is a, a good way and efficient way to identify this um, cost optimal portfolio of resources. But what this model is not good at is representing uncertainty. Um, so it's not really good at answering questions such as, you know, what if prices are higher or lower than we expected? What if the wind is blowing at a different time than we expected? Um, what if, you know, there's spikes in, in you know, load uh, in customer load or heat waves that we didn't expect? And so what we did is, um, you know, first we used the match model to find uh, some optimal portfolios of resources. And then we plugged that into what's called a stochastic model. Um, and essentially what that means is this type of model allows you to run, um, you know, many, many different variations of the same um, simulation and, you know, vary things like what if the wind is blowing at a different time? What if prices are higher or lower at different times? And it provides us with a better estimate of the range of uncertainty for our outcomes um, and a better idea of uh, like risk factors and things like that that we should be um, considering. So next slide. So, you know, I mentioned we've been working on this for the past two years and, and part of the, the journey is that this has been a very um, iterative process. You know, we, we started this trying to design these different scenarios, ask the right questions um, that we wanted the models to answer. And we plugged this into our match model, um, which I mentioned is deterministic. And we analyzed the results and sometimes that would send us back to the drawing board again and we'd have to reconfigure and, and slightly tweak those scenarios. And eventually, once we got those to a good point, um, as I mentioned, we plugged those into this other model, which is called PowerSim, which does that um, uncertainty analysis. And again, we analyze the re results. And sometimes after we looked at those, we had to go all the way back to the beginning uh, and, and rethink our approach again. And so it's been this kind of looping process, but um, eventually we got to this final box, uh, which is what we're presenting here today and really excited uh, to be sharing with you all. 
So next slide, please. Um, so just as a bit of background, we, you know, some of the inputs that we put into this modeling exercise, we considered a wide array of um, resources, including solar photovoltaics, um, hybrid resources, which are a solar and a storage project that are paired together. Um, we considered standalone energy storage projects of many different type, uh, short duration, long duration, um, onshore wind, geothermal, small hydro. And we also looked at some you know, emerging technologies that you know, aren't necessarily available by 2025, but um, you know, which are kind of on the horizon or other emerging technologies that we wanted to at least consider and see if they had a role to play um, in, in a time matched portfolio. So this include things like offshore wind, solar thermal, ocean wave technologies and, and things like that. Um, what we did not consider in our modeling was large hydro or nuclear resources. Um, and this is for several reasons, uh, partially because neither of these resources are considered renewable under the California Renewable Portfolio Standard. Um, a second major reason is just because there's no new large hydro or nuclear capacity that's being built in the state. So there's not really a lot of new resources that are even available for us to procure. Um, and the third is that these resources, typically we aren't able to schedule them. So we have no insight into uh, the times of day that they'll actually be generating, uh, which uh, obviously is, is really important if we're trying to match uh, our load on an hourly basis. Next slide. Um, so we looked, when we were designing these uh, modeling scenarios, we looked at several different types of renewable energy goals that we could pursue. Um, the first thing that we did, though, is that we modeled our existing portfolio as kind of a baseline, uh, baseline scenario that we had something to compare against. And this represents our current budget um, and all of the resources that we've currently signed contracts for and will have uh, operational by 2025. And because this existing portfolio doesn't yet um, achieve 100% renewable on that annual basis, um, just with the contracted resources, it assumes that we'd be using index plus rec contracts to cover the difference between our annual load um, and the contracted renewable PPAs. Um, so we also, the next scenario we looked at was a 100% annual scenario. And this is kind of the status quo when you hear about 100% renewable goals. Um, as Sarah explained, this is accounting on an annual basis. So just matching the annual load volume with an equal amount of contracted renewable energy. And then we also looked at several different variations of time coincidence scenarios. And all of these um, also achieve 100% renewable on an annual basis, but in addition, they also um, achieve different levels of hourly matching as well. So of course we looked at 100% hourly, which means that we're matching 100% of our load in all hours through the year um, with contracted renewable energy. We also looked at slightly lower targets such as 99, 95 and 90% hourly targets, which essentially means that um, we'd be matching, for example, 95% of our load in all hours with contracted renewable energy. Next slide. So in addition to those different types of goals, we also looked at several different market sensitivity um, scenarios, um, and which we're calling the optimistic case and the conservative case. As you've already heard uh, multiple times today, there's been a lot of disruptions in the market um, in 2022. And so our optimistic case is based on market conditions in late 2021 before a lot of these um, disruptions occur and kind of reflect generally lower prices and increased availability of, of resources. And the conservative case um, represents mid 2022 market conditions after all of these um, disruptions had, had taken place and started uh, impacting the markets and generally represent higher um, prices and, and less available resources. Um, so next slide, please. So any questions on this kind of modeling approach background before I launch into um, the portfolio results. I don't see any questions. Great. Well, then I'll launch right into this next set of results. So um, obviously one of the uh, important things that we wanted to know is what types of resources should we be procuring to meet our 24 seven goal? And so all of our, um, as I mentioned, all of our scenarios, we looked at the existing portfolio as a baseline. And so this, um, 
all of our, you know, the 100% annual and all the time coincident model scenarios assumed um, our base existing portfolio of executed contracts that we'd be adding on to. Um, and so in the results that we'll be showing in the next few slides and mostly throughout the presentation, um, we'll be showing incremental um, capacity that we need to add to this existing portfolio to meet our, our goals. And so this existing portfolio um, on this chart on the right, if you kind of read it from inside out, our existing portfolio is about uh, one gigawatt of total capacity, about 60% of which is already online and 40% of which is, is in construction, under construction or will be um, starting uh, operation within the next couple of years. And this is, um, you know, as you all are aware, since you've approved all these projects, um, you know, a mix of solar, wind, geothermal, um, hybrid solar plus storage projects, um, small hydro, um, and, and other uh, storage projects as well. Next slide. So the uh, the modeling results are for our, the additional capacity that we would be adding to our portfolio, or that the model would, is recommending that we add to our portfolio, um, is shown in the chart on the right, and this is showing the conservative um, scenario. And so along the x-axis, we have our different goals with the 100% annual goal on the left uh, and building up to the 100% hourly goal on the right. Um, and generally, what what we're seeing is that um, new capacity that's being added, uh, or the amount of capacity that we need to add is increasing as the time coincident target increases. So the 100% annual uh, target, for example, model was recommending um, adding a mix of uh, mostly solar uh, in yellow, some onshore wind in blue and, and storage in green. And that's about 400 megawatts of additional capacity that we'd add to our existing thousand megawatts of contracted resources. Um, as we move uh, into more and more time coincident targets, generally the amount of capacity that the model is recommending increases. And we also see that more um, firm resources such as geothermal are being selected in that kind of brownish color at the, at the bottom. And we also see um, increased uh, usage of uh, wind and, and energy storage resources as well. Um, since as we saw in that, that heat map that Sarah showed, we already have a lot of um, generation during the middle of the day that's covering those, those midday hours. And so you know, these other resources are helping to complement that. But one of the things that you'll notice is that in the 100% hourly um, scenario, the model is, is recommending that we need to add uh, an additional 1400 megawatts of capacity, which is would more than double the size of our existing portfolio. So that's a lot of um, additional generation. Next slide, please. Um, so speaking of excess generation, um, one of the things that we noticed in our modeling is that, um, you know, while when we're trying to achieve this time coincident target, uh, sometimes what it results in is that we have uh, are the resources that we'd be contracting with are generating more electricity um, during you know hours than we consume, and also generally um, would be generating more electricity than our customers consume on an annual basis as well. And so the the table on the right kind of shows an example of um, <clears throat> the annual volume of um, generation from the recommended uh, portfolio. As compared as a percentage of the, the annual load on an annual basis. So you can see, for example, uh, in the 99% hourly scenario, this would result in us generating 46% more electricity than, um, than is consumed by um, customers in our service territory throughout the year. And so this you know, potentially can you know, introduce certain risks. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know that Medi will go into in more detail as we get into some of the um, cost results, which I believe are next. Um, so next slide. So yeah, any, any questions on this aspect before we move into costs? What happens, I'm sorry. Uh, where does the 46% go? Yeah, so that's a good question. So generally, that um, excess generation would be 
you know, added to the grid. Um, you know, it, it would be used by the grid generally, but it just wouldn't count towards meeting our uh, our 24 seven goal or wouldn't necessarily be consumed by our, our customers. But we're, we're assuming that, you know, there are, there, there are other users on the grid who would, um, you know, be demanding that energy from renewable resources. So essentially we would be buying power for other users. Is that right? We would be generating power that helps um, decarbonize the entire grid. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, most of that energy would be going towards meeting our, our customer um, load or matched with our customer load. But yes, there would be some excess that um, that wouldn't necessarily um, be be used by us currently. Although, you know, as we do more load growth or electrification, there's potential that, um, you know, that that we might grow into that uh, portfolio in the, in the future. Thank you. If I might jump in, we, we would sell that to someone else, Harvey. So where we have excess, we would sell it into the market and someone else would utilize it. Okay. Um, I don't see, I, I thought Mark had had his hand up, but I don't see another hand up at the moment. Go ahead, Greg. I'm gonna... Oh, Rick has a question. Yeah, uh, I've got a question from Rick Mania. So you had mentioned that having all that excess generation, which I'm guessing is generated during a time of the day when we're not using it all, um, but you said it presents certain risk. What is that risk? Uh, it's just expo like more potentially more exposure to market risk. So that's something that Medi will um, get into in some of the cost results and the, especially the stochastic results um, that are able to represent that risk. Okay, I think Jan mentioned though that we could potentially sell excess generation, is that correct? Right. Okay, I'll keep listening, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's important for everybody to recognize that to the extent, when, when you have this annual accounting, which is what the CPUC has required to date, uh, in order to get to 100% clean energy, which we have been providing for the last couple of years, you have to generate more energy than your customers consume. And then you end up selling that additional energy into the market. And there's a risk that you're unable to get cover your cost. So there's a risk that there's a loss. So, you know, in, in the ideal world, you'd be buying what you need. Uh, but it's obvious that to uh, generate the clean energy in the evening, we have to buy more energy than is required. And I've got a comment from Dave or a question. Uh, thank you. Um, um... Greg, if you could re re review, review again why the amount of energy, you know, stair steps up so considerably between 99% time coincidence and 100% time coincidence. I mean, it's just such a market increase, and I, I didn't quite follow what was driving that. Yeah, so part of it is just that there's there's certain hours that um, of the year that are really, you know, there's just not a lot of renewable resources that are available, like for example, winter evenings. Um, and in order to, you know, meet that incremental one, one percent of matching, you know, jumping from 99 to 100%, um, you know, you have to generate the, the most cost effective way that, that the modeling found to do that was to generate more electricity and also dramatically increase the amount of storage so that mm -hmm. that increased amount of electricity could be stored and, you know, used in those you know, one percent of hours that weren't covered in the ninety-nine percent scenario. So, we'll we'll get into this in the cost results too, but we'll we'll see how that affects the the cost as well. That incremental one percent jump. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll hand it off to Mehdi. Thank you, Kirk. So, uh, first to start, Mehdi Shariari and. 
all of our team have been working on this project for the last two years. We are super excited to share these results with everyone. So far, we have looked at uh, why a 24 by 7 renewable energy goal is important. And Greg uh, went over like how we model this and what are the structure of the portfolios that could help us achieve such a goal. But one of the main questions we need to answer is basically what would be the cost of such a 24 by 7 strategy and whether we could achieve it in a cost effective way. So in this section, we are going to answer that question. Before getting into some of the results around our cost of energy, first a review of some of our assumptions. In the next few slides that we are going to review, our cost of energy results are dependent on whether we can resell excess RA or REX. So basically RA is resource adequacy and it's usually like calculated on a monthly basis. So if in a month, uh, the RA qualifying capacity of our portfolio is higher than the RA requirement uh, in, uh, that we are, and that's determined by CPUC, then in that case, we have an excess RA. At the same time, if we have like more renewable generation in our portfolio compared to our load, then we would have excess renewable energy credits or RECs. So we will have the opportunity to resell these excess RA RECs into the market. Based on these like variations in terms of the excess RA or RECs, uh, we are going to look at three different uh, variation for the model results. The first one is cost of energy no resale. That's basically in this scenario, we are not going to credit ourselves for any resale of excess RA or RECs. The other variation is cost of energy with resale, that in this, this case, we are going to give ourselves full credit for resale of all excess RA and RECs in our portfolio. The third variation, which is the default assumptions, and we call it the expected cost of energy, is giving ourselves a 75% resale value for excess RA or REX in our portfolio. And that's basically because in short term, we expect to be able to resell most of the excess RA and REX. So that 75% could be also considered some kind of conservative view of how much excess value we get from these RA and REX. In the long term, however, there is more uncertainty around ability to resell as like more communities like switch to renewable energy, they set higher renewable energy targets, then there will be smaller demand in the market for such attributes. So, and it might also drop the value of such uh, attributes as well. So in long term, there's smaller uncertainty around like ex the value for excess RA and rates. So but Mary, Mary, I, I just want to let everyone know that this is the critical area of risk in our business. I, this is very technical. And I mean, I'm sure there are some board members that are totally spacing out on this because it's very technical. But when, when you buy energy, you buy both the actual power in the energy and, and if it's renewable, you get these, energy, these renewable energy credits, which can be separated from the actual power and how you manage that, which is what exactly what Medi is addressing here, is where the risk is. This, this is the critical risk in our business. Thank you, Rich. So basically, like in the long term, there will be like more uncertainty, more risk around like how we can like value these excess RA or regs that we have in our portfolio. But uh, one of the bright side is like. Uh, over long term, our renewable energy contracts, especially the short and mid term contracts, will expire and our load grows. So, we will need to continually procure resources. And in this way, uh, we will be able to reassess our portfolio with each year's procurement to basically understand whether that uh, time to instant target that we are setting, whether it's like too high or if we have like opportunity to increase that time to incident target. So with this background, I can get into some of our cost results. So the first set of results we are going to look at is based on the conservative case results. So that's based on the current market conditions. 
and this table shows the deterministic results. The number you can see in this table are the difference in expected cost of energy relative to existing portfolio. So when you see a negative number, basically shows that scenario would be cheaper compared to our existing portfolio. And you see a positive number that shows that scenario is going to be more expensive than our existing portfolio. So basically here, this table tells us that we can achieve a 90% hourly uh, target at the same cost as our existing portfolio. In order to increase the time coincident target to 99% hourly, that would increase our cost of energy by 2%. However, you can see here, as Greg showed in terms of like the resources that we need in our portfolio, for 100% time coincident scenario, our cost of energy would be increased significantly by around 12% compared to our existing portfolio. But basically you can see as up to a, a time coincident procurement of up to 99% can be achieved with only 2% cost increase compared to our existing portfolio. So those results were based on the conservative case or the current market conditions. And Greg mentioned that like the market has changed significantly recently. And when we first started this analysis, we had our initial results back in January, which we called our optimistic case, uh, the results were different. So what you see in this graph here, there are like two sets of results for optimistic case and the conservative case. On the vertical axis, we have our cost of energy in percentage. And on the horizontal axis, we have the different scenarios. For each scenario, you can see there are like two bars. The blue bars show the optimistic case, the orange bars show the conservative case. And the base scenario here is our existing portfolio conservative case, which is set at 100%. So if a scenario is above 100%, basically shows us that that scenario is more expensive than the existing portfolio. If it's below 100%, that basically shows that scenario would be less expensive compared to the existing portfolio. So, there are two main patterns that you can see in this graph. One is if you look at like each scenario, compare the blue bar with the orange bars, you can see the orange bars are larger or higher than the blue bars. And that basically shows based on the current market disruption, we see uh, cost of energy have increased. And that's not only for the time coincidence scenarios, but rather you can see for our existing portfolio, our cost of energy have increased by around like two to 3% as well. The other pattern that you see here is basically, if you just look at like one set of colors, if you look at the orange bars, as we explained in the previous graph, most of the time coincidence scenarios would be either as the same cost as our existing portfolio or a higher cost, such as a 95, 99 or 100% times coincidence scenario. But if we just look at the blue bars and we look at like the optimistic case, we can see the 90%, 95 and 99% scenarios are actually cheaper than the existing portfolio uh, scenario. So basically under an optimistic case or cost of energy for a time coincidence scenario up to 99% could have been lower compared to our existing portfolio. So the major conclusion I get from this graph is uh, renewable energy procurement on a time coincident basis is, is cost effective and under right market conditions, it could actually decrease our cost of energy. And just like to wrap up, I would say that the recent, with the recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, we are hopeful that the market return to the late 2021 conditions, which would decrease our cost of energy. See, there's a question from Carlos. So, Carlos, go ahead, please. Yeah, Mehdi, is, is there any reason or could we run a stochastic analysis on this um, as opposed to using a deterministic model? Um, yeah. We actually have a stochastic result. So after these two slides, I will get into some of the stochastic results so we can look at like the range of uncertainty for right. the results. Okay, thanks. That, that make you more comfortable. Okay. So this is like 
these two results basically show the results from our deterministic modeling from match model. But one of the challenges with the deterministic model, as Greg mentioned, is just it assumes like one set of inputs and one set of outputs. To, so basically it cannot model any uncertainty or variability in uh, the analysis. To do that, we use a stochastic modeling and we usually in our stochastic analysis, we include like 50 simulations. And when we say 50 simulations, like they're, they're like basically modeling different scenarios. And in these scenarios, we would see like different weather patterns that could impact the load, could impact renewable generation. And we can also see the variability in market prices across these scenarios. And this would enable us to quantify the risk or, or, or uncertainty around our cost of energy. And in order to interpret stochastic results, we often use the box plot or often called like a box whisker plot. And we have an example of that here on this slide. So you can see like a box whisker plot here. So if you look at like the gray area, the box in the middle of the graph, there's like a horizontal line in the middle of the gray box, which we call the median or the 50th percentile. And this is the value that is bigger than 50% of simulations and the smaller than 50% of simulations. And then we have the lower quartile, which is the 25th percentile. It's like bigger than 25% of simulations, smaller than 75% of simulations. And then we have also the upper quartile of 75th percentile. And then you can see the whiskers, and then we have the lower extreme or upper extreme, which shown by those uh, horizontal lines. So basically with the box plot, we can see a distribution of the values. We can see a range of likely outcomes. And we are going to use a box plot to look at some of the stochastic results from our analysis. Okay. So with that background, we can look at some of the stochastic results from our modeling. Here, we are going to look at the range of likely outcomes for our cost of energy. While a deterministic model gives us an expected cost of energy, we know there is a range of likely outcomes based on like different market conditions. Here on this graph, on the vertical axis, we have cost of energy in percentage. On the horizontal axis, we have different scenarios. And you can see for each scenario, there are like two boxes. The red boxes are cost of energy without any resale of excess RAO rates. And the blue boxes are cost of energy with full resale value for excess RAO rates. So there is that uncertainty around like ability to sell excess RAO rates. And in this graph, if you look at like the red box for the existing portfolio, the median is set at 100%. So that's like the base scenario. And all the other simulations in other scenarios are basically compared to that base scenario. So if anything is above 100%, it shows like the cost is higher compared to that like base scenario. Anything below 100%, shows the cost is below that uh, or lower than that base scenario. So there are like two main sources of uncertainty that we can see in this graph. One, as I mentioned, is uncertainty around ability to resell excess RAO rex, which you can see with the blue and red boxes for this scenario. And you can see as we move to higher time coincident target, the difference between the yellow, sorry, the blue and red boxes becomes larger as we have like more generation, more capacity on, in our portfolio. So the value of that excess RA and or regs becomes a bigger part of the portfolio. The other thing you can see is basically the length or the range of the each color box. So if, for example, you look at like the blue box for the 99% hourly scenario, in that case, you can see like the lower extreme of that box is at 90%. The upper range is 110%. That upper extreme is kind of like below the red box for the 99%. So that's basically tells us for the 99% hourly scenario, we expect the cost to be in the range of somewhere 10% lower than our existing portfolio, up to 10% higher than our existing portfolio. 
And that basically comes from the uncertainty around market prices. So I have another slide on stochastic analysis. I would like to go over that and then answer any questions about this. So and in order to be able to quantify that uncertainty around the market prices, a metric that we often use is called risk premium, which is a measure of the potential for cost increase in the worst case scenario. Basically, risk premium tells us in the worst case scenario how much we expect our cost of energy to increase. So if you look at the graph here, on the vertical axis, we have risk in percentage. And on the horizontal axis, we have the different scenarios. So for example, if you look at the existing portfolio, you can see the risk is around 12%. So this is telling us that in the worst case scenario, we expect our cost of energy for the existing portfolio to increase by around 12%. And if you look at like all of like the different scenarios, you can see the 99% scenario has the lowest risk premium at 6%. And again, you can see for the 100% overlay, as Greg showed, we have a lot of excess generation, excess capacity in portfolio that brings a new kind of risk to our portfolio. So you can see the risk premium for the 100% is actually higher than the other time coincidence scenarios. This is the last slide on the risk part of our analysis. So we would like to know like how does the board feel about like a potential for a 2% cost increase in a conservative case, if we pursue the 99% hourly goal and in general, what everyone thinks about like 99% versus a cost of 100% hourly goal. Great, okay, um, so let's take questions from the board. Carlos. Yeah, Mehdi, can you go back three slides? Um, right there, yeah. So um, the blue reflects a 100% recapture of um, on, on the sale of excess energy, or is it discounted for um, you know entry in the market uh, at the time that maybe there's an over, supply of, of energy or how, how, how do you how, how are you calculating that 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 resale so the resale assumes that we can basically resell all of the excess ra or recs but the value that we considered for that in the market is a discounted rate so if we if the forecast let's say is for excess like rex is like ten dollar we are assuming like 80 percent of that Okay, so we are so, already discounting some part of that in our evaluation. So, so you you did you use the eighty twenty as an example, or are you actually discounting um, in your model twenty percent on re I think for, it's, for resale? I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's somewhere between seventy five to eighty percent, the exact uh -huh. number. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And just to answer your question, for short term, we believe that that blue box is much more closer to reality because uh, there's more demand for those attributes in the short term. However, in the long term, like, you know, with more communities switching to renewable energy and setting like higher renewable targets, there might be a smaller demand in the market and the value of such attributes might drop as well. But in the short term, we expect our cost of energy to be much closer to the blue box rather than the red box. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are hedges out there for this because the financial markets can basically hedge anything, but I'd be curious to see if there were a way to, to box that, that loss in more, but it depends on what it would cost, right, Donna? Anyway, okay, thank you. Uh, Mehdi, I have a question. Uh, so the gap between the resale, which obviously is more economically beneficial to PCE than the non-resale in the 100% uh, scenario is, is fairly significant. Uh, what and, and in the 95% scenario, it, it's far less significant. And what you don't show is the difference between 95 and 99. Uh, and I, I'm just assuming that the incremental change 
for 96, 7, and 8 is kind of in between 95 and 99, and that those show uh, the real difference that we should be focused on. But I, I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, like the scenario that we focused on for this analysis was like 90, 95, 99, and 100. But yeah, like if you look at like the 96 or 97, it would be somewhere between like the 95 and 99%, basically. And the reason for the 100% to be bigger, that's because like we have a much higher uh, amount of additional capacity in our portfolio. So like excess RA and rates, it's like much more in our portfolio in those, in that scenario. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, let me take, I've got a couple of public comments. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Thank you. Mark Roos, Sustainable Energy Inc. Um, I've got some questions. What are your prices per kilowatt hour for like levelized cost of energy for solar, wind and storage that you're assuming? <clears throat> I think these are like our PPAs. I don't know if like this is like a public uh, information that we can release here. Can I can answer. Sort of give me the fuzzy answer. Mehdi, I can answer that. I'll, I'll step in. Yeah, we, we keep those prices confidential. We don't, um, you know, even when we have a PPA that we're approving, we don't reveal the prices. So what we're showing here is percent of okay. percent change in the cost of energy, but we don't show the actual cost of energy okay. in dollars okay. per megawatt hour. All right, so I don't get to do a compare and contrast, but I just give you some information and you can do the compare and contrast privately. Okay, so um, looking at storage um, where the levelized cost of energy is under a penny per kilowatt hour and under and the same for solar, and wind, um, and the, so the wind would be like maybe five years from now. The solar is probably a year from now. The battery is probably half a year from now. You know, maybe somewhere between nine and fifteen months for both of them. So the question that I was going to ask you to do was to, to look at how much, uh, how that how that kind of pricing would change these. Uh, outcomes, and I'm, I'm assuming it would change them an awful lot, because I'm, I'm assuming that you're dealing with contemporary prices for these things, and that um, the technology that we're wanting to bring out will be a whole lot different. So I guess just to put that idea in your head, um, and part of the, with the solar, for instance, if you have much less expensive solar than you expect, then you can uh, graduate, you don't have to put as much energy producing in, in to reach that 100% because you can just soak, you know, soak it up into storage. Um, and then you have the, the quite, and, and then you get to figure out what the balance is between risk of whether you can sell it or not and how much you actually need. But it should be a whole lot less expensive for you to both get renewable energy and to store renewable energy. Okay, okay thank you. Drew. Hello, good evening. I think this is a fantastic general goal. I really appreciate this. It's very exciting. Thank you to all the presenters and stuff on this. I have a couple questions, uh, hopefully fairly simple, and they might apply to earlier presenters. Um, in this segment. So I okay, just be aware that, that the staff is not responding to public comment. You, you please give your public comment. I think it's important. And then the staff will think about it. Thanks. I understand. I'm not pausing for my questions. Um, I was just wondering, did the portfolio that's being shown include like projected growth demands for the portfolio for like EVs and all the electrification coming over like in the next five to 10 years kind of stuff. So that was one. The other was um, with some of this modeling, does it 
because there's a lot of stuff with the batteries. And so does that uh, make assumptions on how fast the batteries need to be discharged, like in four hours or the sub peak, or because this is especially in the hundred percent case, could the battery, in a sense, the batteries could last for several days before they have to be uh, pulled down to put that power back into the system and stuff. Just was wondering how to deal with a little bit of that. Um, what assumptions? And then the other one was, and I'm assuming kind of this is included, is just the model, like, you know, in the summer it's sunny and stuff, a lot of sunny though, we did have some rain, but in the winter we could have a week of rain and stuff. And so how do you deal with kind of the weather effects and stuff on some of the generation and stuff? I'm assuming the model takes care of that. So it's just kind of maybe a yes, no. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Drew. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as a former modeler, I'm extremely impressed by the work that's been put into this, and I want to congratulate the team for a very clear um, presentation. Um, I do have a few questions. So one simple one is, in the current scenario, what is the percentage of hourly match between what PCE is procured and what PCE customers buy? Um, the other thing is, I'm, I must admit that I'm quite surprised at how little the additional cost is for a 99% hourly match. Uh, that is counterintuitive for me and uh, a wonderful piece of news for anybody who cares about sustainability. Um, I wanted to ask about whether there was a possibility that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, solar energy in the summer would have a negative price if it were sold into the grid. And if that were the case, uh, do the contracts that PCE is entering into allow for curtailment of energy production, for example, by uh, rotating tracking solar panels away from the sun so they don't generate any energy or any recs? Um, and I also wonder if at some point the analysis will expand to include um, demand response, asking people to use less energy as Ohm Connect does to me about every other day, or uh, alternative pricing regimens uh, based on critical peak pricing or similar ideas, so that instead of having to build a lot of expensive storage for the 1% case that gets us to 100%, um, there would be a pricing signal to customers that would cause them to reduce their energy demand during those dark winter nights when it's so very expensive to provide uh, carbon-free GHG free, GHG free energy. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other public comment. So I will close public comment and bring it back to the board. Pradeep. Actually, uh, Bruce uh, already mentioned the uh, comment I was going to make, uh, Rick, that was uh, the demand side possibilities have not been taken into account in this modeling, I suppose, uh, that uh, there might be some uh, refinement that might come through if those demand side management possibilities were also included. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that is something that had been discussed in the subcommittee. Mehdi, do you want to comment on that, on the issue of the demand side considerations? Yeah, basically, uh, to answer that, uh, we have considered some kind of like changes in our load shapes, basically like EV charging or building ele electrification. We have considered like how those could impact our load shapes. For demand response, we are in the process of starting that. We don't think at least in the near future, especially for like 25, 26, that would be a big part of our portfolio, but like in the later years, that could become a bigger part and impacting our load shape. But in the near future, we don't we won't expect that to a big part and impact our portfolio. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, Carlos. Uh, yes, sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Um, so do you, in your in, in your analysis, you, you've looked at a, a no resale um, possibility and um, what why would we so a no resale possibility exists if we over uh, produce 
because the market is saturated and we would just end up with the energy and couldn't sell it? Is that, is that correct? That's my first question. So I don't know if you want why, why, to, why we're looking at a no resale um, uh, analysis compared to the, to the with resale, but could you explain that? And then I have one further question. Yep. So basically you're right. Like for, especially in the long term, if more communities are like uh, setting like high renewable targets, there might be a smaller demand in the market for these kind of attributes, especially RECs. Mm -hmm. And it might also drop the value of like such environmental attributes because there's a smaller demand. A lot of communities might have these kind of excess RECs. So that's why we also looked at like a scenario with no resale to show like kind of like a, what would be like the highest risk for our portfolio if we cannot sell any of those excess uh, attributes that we have in our portfolio. But in the near term, there's much more certainty like around like how much we can sell these attributes over long term. Like, yeah, that's true. That's like why we looked at the no resale option. But as I mentioned in the beginning of like talking about these different scenarios, uh, as our load grows, our short and medium term contract expire, there will, there will be open position in our portfolio. So we can reassess like this every time. So now we are saying we are doing a 99% time, 99% time coincident target. So if in future we see there's a small value in those like excess RA or REC, then we can think about maybe reducing our time coincident target. So my, my follow on question to this is then uh, we could, however, so we run the risk of loss. But we could also, in certain situations, depending on where the market is and where demand is, um, could be in a situation where, in a, where we're in an arbitrage position, correct? Where actually we could have paid less for the energy that we're actually getting uh, if we resell. Is that, is, or, or is that just assumed uh, not to happen? Are you thinking about like the wholesale market prices or the value for like these attributes such as RA or Rex? Well, I mean, it, it, it's it both, right? I mean, go, yeah, go ahead. So for the RA and Rex, yeah, like because especially because of like these like sub supply chain issues we have seen in the last few like months, like a lot of projects have been delayed or canceled. Mm -hmm. So we have seen like, for example, the price for Rex have increased significantly in the last few months compared to like last year. So there's that possibility. There are also like some discussions around like changes for RA that could actually make our time coincident target much cheaper for us. If everyone is supposed to do like a, basically like an hourly RA instead of a monthly RA, that's the framework right now. And in terms of the wholesale market prices, that's the part that we looked at the risk premium Basically, yeah, like that uncertainty in market prices when like market prices go up and down, that could impact our portfolio. But that's not that's not limited only to the, to the time coincidence scenarios. As you saw for our existing portfolio, the risk premium is actually larger. So when we have like a open position in our portfolio, if we don't do financial hedges, in that case, then we are exposed to those like market prices basically. So so you and, and your 20% um kind of risk premium or discount takes into consideration um both the possibility of well maybe you'll make a little teeny bit but also the possibility of of losing and that's that's where you come come up with that that discounted yeah. rate. Right? That's just funded yeah, that's just funded rate where we apply that for the renewable energy credits. So basically we are thinking like if the value in future drops, you know, like we are looking at a conservative view of our ability to sell that excess Rex basically. Okay, I, I see. All right, it seems like it's absent of that. All right, thank you. Okay, um, uh, I'll, I'll take additional board comments here, but just be aware, uh, staff has a number of additional slides to present on this topic. I'll take public comment at the end of those slides, but I'm not going to take more public comment now. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. A um, couple of things. 
Carlos, you bring up a really interesting point because the, the grid of the future that relies on intermittent renewable resources will have to be massively overbuilt. Um, we will have to find some way to sort of account for the fact that a lot of power gets produced or is available that can't be used. I hadn't thought of financialization as a, as a solution to that. I'm not sure if that's viable, but you know, other things include, for example, integrating KAISA with the rest of the Western um, part of the United States so that our solar could go somewhere uh, later in the day or earlier in the day, uh, getting wind from other parts of, of, of the country when we need power, you know, from Colorado or, is, you know, or even the Midwest. Um, it's an interesting question that probably should be continued offline. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say in general was that, you know, five or seven years ago, papers were coming out, we were debating whether you could run the grid with 80% variable intermittent renewables. The fact that we're sitting here looking at a scenario of 99% time coincident renewables with only a very modest increase in, in, uh, in our costs, to me is phenomenal. Uh, and that's, that's the big picture that I, I, I just wanna remind people of here. Um, these questions are important and it's interesting, but I just wanna point out, this is great work. And I was, you know, Bruce was pleasantly surprised. I was overjoyed to see this. This is just a really amazing result and I'm looking forward to, to seeing more of it as we go forward. Great, thanks Jeff. John. Uh, yeah, I, I I echo everything Jeff said, and um, you know you spe specifically asked uh, the question, um, you know, would the board, um, you know, go for the deal of uh, ninety nine percent coincident uh, power uh, at only uh, uh, two percent more cost, and I, I think, you know, probably most or all of us would. And I just wanted to make that explicit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other uh, questions from the board. So let's move on. Okay. So can you see the screen again? Yes. Okay. So the next section I'm going to talk about some general like benefits in terms of a 24 by seven results in talking about the emission and grid impacts of a 24 by seven renewable strategy. So first I'm going to look at the emission reductions of our 24 by seven goal. There are like two main metrics we look at. The first one is an overly carbon footprint. That's basically and uh, look at our share of grid emissions on an hourly basis. And this is like similar to the accounting framework that Sarah talked about. And this is like basically looking at the hourly versus an annual framework. So on this graph on the vertical axis, we have the uh, carbon footprint in tons of CO2 per megawatt hour of generation. And then on the horizontal axis, we have our scenarios. As you can see, and as Sarah showed in her presentation, our existing portfolio has a bit more than 200 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. That's our uh, carbon footprint for our portfolio. But you can see as we move to a 99% hourly, you can reduce that 200 tons to around like 30 tons per megawatt hour of generation. So a significant reduction in the emissions. You can see there is like some slight improvement in emission reduction when we move to the 100%. But most of that benefit in emission reduction will be realized by moving to a 99% already target. The next metric in terms of emissions is the avoided emissions. So these are basically the grid emissions. When we say grid, we mean like the whole California electricity grid. Those emissions displayed, displaced by our portfolio in the long run. And in this graph, we we are going to look at the change in the long run emissions. Again, the units are pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour of generation. You can see all these numbers are negative, basically showing it's like reducing the emissions on the grid. And you can see the scenarios on the horizontal axis. So we prefer to have like a larger or a more negative number. You can see the value for our existing portfolio is 80 pounds of CO2, while for a 99% hourly, and that would be closer to 130 tons of CO2. So there is more redu emission reduction or avoided emission on the grid because of how we run our portfolio. 
there is like some additional benefit as well if you move to 100% overly scenario. But you can see that most of that uh, benefit in terms of emission reduction will be realized by moving to a 99% target. Another uh, positive impact on the grid of a 24 by seven strategy could be realized by looking at the system net bit. Again, when we say system, we mean the whole California grid. And the system net peak is defined as uh, the peak demand in California grid minus any renewable generation that is operating in a specific hour on the grid. And here again, uh, we are going to look at this graph, which shows a change in system net peak in megawatt. Again, we prefer a more or a larger negative number. So basically, this graph shows us that for our existing portfolio, the system net peak will be reduced by 250 megawatt. And that's basically like mostly displacing like maybe uh, making gas like uh, generators that are operating on the fuel. So basically we are going to reduce emissions through this as well and displacing some of those uh, and generators and in general like improving the entire grid system operation. As you can see, if we move to a 99% hourly scenario, that change in system peak would be closer to 400 megawatt. And there's an additional benefit of 50 megawatt if we move to 100%. But again, you can see most of that benefit will be realized by getting to a 99% scenario. And the last piece that I would like to talk about on the results, which is also an important section, is in general, we talked a lot about like a stochastic result in terms of cost. But one of the main question is like, if we plan like a specific time coincident target, how that portfolio would actually perform in real time. So that's basically uh, thinking about the variability in load and generation. So to basically do this kind of analysis, we looked at our stochastic modeling and you can see the results of that in this graph. We have the person time coincident on the vertical axis. You have the scenarios on the horizontal axis. And the red circle shows our planning target. So for example, you can see for 100% hourly, that's the 200%. For the 90%, that's the 290%. And you can see for our existing portfolio, or 100% annual scenarios, there is no hourly target. So that's why you don't see a red circle there. And the blue boxes show the range for the time coincident scenario based on simulation. And we believe in real time operations, our portfolio will be closer to those blue boxes rather than the planning target. And you can see in general, the portfolios fall short of the time coincident target by somewhere between one to 3%. And that's due to the variability in load and generation. For example, you can see then while we can plan for 99% time coincident portfolio, in reality, that could be closer to 96 to 98%. So the main question is like, how do we feel about like a 96 or 98 to 98% like real time time coincident of portfolio? And this is the last section of our results. Any questions on this section? I don't see any question. Oh, Carlos, go yeah, ahead. So, so does, would this mean that we would be marketing, this, does this mean that we would be marketing the 99% time coincident um, uh, energy expenditure, but we would be looking at a target between 96 and 98, or we would actually be saying, no, we're at 98% or 96% time coincident. What? Oh, yeah. that's a good question, Carlos. So basically like right now we are 99% based on a planning forecast. And that's like the phase one of our modeling or phase one of our 24 by seven strategy. In the phase two, after like 2025 and later, we are going to focus on real time. And part of that is also some part is due to variability in load and generation. And some part of that would be related to 
lack of real time access to some uh, our data, specifically our load. You usually get that from PGE with like a three day delay. So that's basically would be difficult for us to achieve a time constant target in real time. So for now, we have a 99% on a planning forecast basis. Okay, we can move on. Okay. So this is the last piece on the results section. The next section, challenges and risk, and Sarah we will go over this section. Thanks, Mehdi. I'm going to step in and give Mehdi a break from all um, of the talking he's had to do. But um, So I wanted to review some important challenges and risks that this approach will face. Um, the first two bullets here we have already talked about in the context of the stochastic results um, that Mehdi shared. So there's uncertainty around our ability to resell RECs and RA. Um, and we're also sensitive to market conditions. So I think we've talked about those two already. Um, the next risk we do wanna to bring to the board's attention is that there's a risk um, around our ability to contract for the types of resources we've modeled. Um, so, you know, we've assumed certain resources will be available at certain PPA prices, um, but, you know, there's an uncertainty about whether those resources will actually offer into our solicitations and whether we'll be able to reach agreement on a contract and execute a contract. Um, and we may be faced eventually with a decision of needing to accept unfavorable contract terms in order to secure certain contracts to meet this goal. Um, and if we decide not to accept unfavorable contract terms, it could result in a delay of achieving our goal uh, to, until 2026. Um, so we do want the board to be aware of that risk. We are working hard to negotiate these contracts um, and we'll update the board um, as negotiations progress. Um, there's regulatory uncertainty. So there's massive changes happening in the resource adequacy space, as the board may be aware. The 24 hour resource adequacy framework um, has been adopted, but the details have not yet been worked out. So we're hopeful that would be compatible with our goal, but it remains to be seen. And there's also um, new developments in the integrated resources planning space led by the CPUC, um, and there may be additional procurement mandates that we will be required to achieve. Um, basically, the CPUC might require us to procure certain types of resources that may be not optimal considering our 24-7 goals. So there's those risks. And finally, there is no official tracking system or accounting framework to communicate and validate a 24-7 um, renewable approach. Uh, the passage of Senate Bill 1158, which we've mentioned a couple times tonight, will help to develop those new tracking systems um, and create a new industry standard. But that's, uh, again, still very much in its infancy. Um, those are the main risks we wanted to share with the board. So if there's any questions on this section, we can take them now. And if well, let me make a comment and encourage others to comment. Uh, I think those risks, Sarah, are extremely well stated. The, these, these are absolutely our risks. And, um, you know, there's things we can't do much about. I, we can try to have some influence over the PUC, but the reality is they've uh, uh, handed down requirements that we have to adjust to. So that, that is absolutely one of our risks, uh, which is regulatory uncertainty. And I think we've made, if you look back over our six year history, I'm, this is just my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt, but I think there's been two mistakes that we've made in the power procurement area. One, at the beginning, we knew that we were ahead of the game and that the, uh, the solar resources that were available were cheap and getting cheaper. And, and it took us a long time to really close on uh, the after the right deal, which we executed extremely quickly to our great advantage. Uh, it took us a long time to close on additional deals 
I think we lost a little bit of time there. I also think that when we first entered into the, the geothermal deal with the geysers, that it would have been wise to have contracted for more power. Those are retrospective views that are very easy to make and very hard to predict looking forward. But I, I, I think the critical thing is looking at the market and, and, and you guys have the really deep understanding of this. I think those of us on the board, well, some member, a couple members on the board have pretty deep understanding, uh, but most of us have relatively limited understanding and looking ahead to see where this market is going is really important. And, and for you to share your expertise in terms of your predictions with us, and, and then for all of us to make a judgment about what to do is the critical thing. That, that's really where the art is in this and frankly, any business. And, uh, you know, I think we've done pretty well. And, and here we are, uh, we're talking about a series of risks that other people aren't quite at the, port of at the point of evaluating because we're really talking about how to go to this 24 seven responsible position. And ultimately all LSEs are gonna have to get there, but we're out there on our own. And, and that's why your last bullet point is relevant. We're, we're really on our own. So we're cutting ground and, and we should be proud of it. Uh, I think to be economically successful in that assessment, we really have to make some judgments about where we think things are going. And, um, you know, we, all of us rely on you to help with that. So diving into this is really important. And, and I just greatly appreciate the amount of work that you all have done. Uh, Donna. Uh, thank you, Rick. So when I take a look at this risk chart, um, I also understand that these risks are also inherent in the current way that we are managing the portfolio, correct? So there are risks that are, they're incremental, and it's a little bit hard to assess them exactly, but um, they already kind of exist in what we're doing. So I like Car uh, Carlos's uh, idea of you know, checking into the financial markets and looking to see if there is any hedging opportunity or financial engineering that we can use or do to mitigate the financial risk um, of this. And, or if there isn't, you know, we might want to even speak to or talk to, and you know, a couple of investment banks or market makers and see if they, you know, can understand this concept and would be willing to try to make the market in it. <clears throat> so there's a lot of really interesting work to do in this um, outside of just the regular stochastic modeling and all the sort of interesting um, statistical analysis that goes into the underlying concept. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation on ways that we can manage this that um, might be, um, you know, unique and offer step two for, for risk reduction. But thank you, staff, for all this great work. I've heard this presentation, I think, now three times. And every time I really enjoy it more and more. Learning more and more. Great. Thanks, Donna. Jeff. Thanks. Uh, I actually want to take Rick and Donna's comments about these risks and to go one step further. Uh, we're actually, I think we are actually helping redefine some of these risks. I mean, SB 1158, we worked closely with Josh to get that passed partly because it's reflective of what we're doing. I think, you know, I think the regulatory uncertainty, I think the states at some point is gonna start looking to us to see what happens as we do this hourly rollout because they're, 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 they know they have to go in this direction for everyone. I think we're actually redefining some of these regulatory risks in doing this. And so it's sort of, it's, it's a, in a sense where we're almost going beyond risk anticipation and starting to actually manage and even, even maybe even define some of our risks or redefine some of our risks, which I think is one of the more interesting things about this work that I haven't thought about before. Um, and I'll just also, you know, once again, commend staff for all the, the great work that has gone into this. Great. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, I was just gonna say that from a risk mitigation perspective, um, I mean, this might require the, the board, the finance committee, and the executive board to think about 
you know, are we carrying at least in the short term as we implement this uh, large enough, a large enough reserve to, um, you know, potentially receive the uncertainties of going, uh, you know, down this path, uh, you know, do, does it mean that we have to add, you know, a certain amount to the reserve and that may restrict how we spend other money. But um, I mean, I, I think there is some inherent uh, uncertainty here. And, and um, I mean, one of the ways other than trying to hedge against it or fi finding, you know, markets that might be willing to, to take on some of the risk that we're taking on is to think about, do we need to increase um, reserves in order to go down this path since we're not quite sure, but it's still financially murky. So that's all. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, John. Um, with respect to the, um, the unfavorable contract terms, that uh, the risk of, of those, um, probably the type of energy that is most subject to that is wind. And, you know, there is, there is a large wind component assumed in the modeling and, um, and the California market is basically saturated. Uh, it, uh, so we're gonna have to uh, go further afield to get that and um, it may cost us more. So just, just a comment there. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Rick Bonilla. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, I just wanna say that uh, uh, I have been watching, listening, thinking about this subject uh, as we have been working towards it for a number of years, like Jan said in the earlier presentation, since really we started with this in 2016, which is the first year that PCE went into operation. Um, there is risk, uh, uh, you know, there are different kinds of risks. There are, you know, uh, careless, not well thought through, um, unmanaged and unmanageable risks. And then there are risks that are well calculated, that are deeply researched, um, that, uh, uh, can be managed somewhat. And I have to say that I'm very proud to be part of this organization where we have some of the greatest minds in California in this business here assembled right now. Um, I wanna show uh, uh, a lot of um, credit. I wanna throw a lot of credit to uh, Jan Pepper um, for being at the helm and um, assembling the crew that has worked this way. Uh, I want to thank our current state senator, Josh Becker, who's doing a lot to help. Smart guy, only, only a couple of years really doing this, but he's really um, uh, uh, taken uh, uh, many of the most important issues in the state and run with them, and he's been successful. Um, I want to thank the members of the executive committee and the finance and audit committee for tracking, being very careful, very thoughtful, asking a lot of the right questions, uh, making sure we're approaching this as carefully as we need to. And I wanna thank all the board members for being here and supporting and, and um, becoming as informed as you can uh, to help bring your public along. When you are asked questions, you know there's a resource, you can get answers. I know that I have here in my city, some people who are greatly influenced by the Fox Entertainment Network, who are big naysayers about everything uh, that has to do with renewable energy or with electrification. Um, and uh, we all have to deal with that, I think, from time to time. But uh, I think here, this is the place, especially this retreat meeting right now, where with all of these facts assembled, um, I'm feeling very confident. And uh, I, I think the level of risk is acceptable. I understand there's some uncertainty there. I really appreciate what Carlos just said about considering increasing our reserves. Um, I think that's worth looking at and thinking about. So those are my comments. Basically, thank you. Have a good night. Okay, thanks, Rick. Pradeep. Thank you, Rick. Uh, just wanted to 
make a comment. I haven't thought about it too much yet, but in addition to challenges and risks, there are some opportunities too, which I think we should keep in mind because as we go further into this framework, I'm sure that we will not be isolated in this thinking. There'll be other CCAs and other neighboring and other CC organizations looking at the same kind of situations and may, making their own uh, estimations and in terms of their portfolios. So what I'm saying is that there's opportunity that if there's a bigger groundwork with many, many entities involved in trying to create this kind of, and uh, I, I think that Carlos put it very nicely that the level of reserve that would be needed a reserve margin in order to meet the 24-hour, uh, 24-7 framework, will could that reserve be shared among many different entities? So there might be some possibilities of creating a market of reserves that may be more optimal than everyone looking at it themselves in isolation. So just a comment to think about. Thank you. Uh I have a question for staff. Uh, is um, the um, is, is there a request here that we change the goal from one hundred percent to ninety nine percent? Because it looks very weighted that ninety nine percent is more reasonable to achieve than one hundred percent, and that was kind of my interpretation from when it was presented at the subcommittee. But is that is that a request tonight or is that something that uh, we'll deal with in the future? Uh, we don't have this as an action item uh, for tonight for a vote. So um, I think we would ask uh, our attorney, but I, I think we could come back to you with that. Yeah, I think that's fine. I just wanted to ask the question because it, it clearly was... I don't know if I, I don't know if I was muted or not there, but what I said was, uh, I think that's fine. Uh, we don't need to make it an action item, but uh, it kind of begged the question, so we can deal with that in the future. Yeah, we just have uh, three kind of summary slides to finish up here, and then, you know, we do have another substantial presentation from the programs team on the 2035 decarbonization. So um, I think Sarah, you were going to wrap it up here. Yeah, let me quickly walk through our summary. I'm really excited to share this result with you. As you've seen, our analysis shows that our time coincident renewable procurement goal can be cost effective under a variety of market conditions. Anywhere between potentially a 1% decrease in our average cost to a 2% increase in our average cost. Um, I, I think this is just a remarkable result and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. And also, as we saw, this uh, time coincident renewable energy procurement results in uh, extensive benefits to society by helping to reduce emissions and improving how the California grid operates. So um, we have this phrased as a recommendation, but as Jan pointed out, this is not an action item, um, just food for thought for next time. But we're recommending we target 99% time coincident renewable energy on a planning forecast basis. And as we saw, the 100% target will be less cost effective, more expensive, and the 99% target maximizes the benefits to our customers in a cost effective way. And then finally, our next steps will be continuing to work on the white paper. We're hoping to publish a part two very soon where we'll share these results. Um, we are, of course, continuing to evaluate and procure short, medium, and long term resources to add to our portfolio. And we are continually evaluating the cost effectiveness of our goal based on the current market conditions. And uh, with that, that concludes our presentation. Um, really enjoyed sharing this with you all tonight and thank you for the discussion. Okay, great. So I've got a couple public comments. I'll take those and then if there's any board comments, we'll take those, but please be aware we're at 8.30 and we've got another 75 minutes of presentation planned for this next uh, strategic goal. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Um, so 
uh, want to reinforce Pradeep's point uh, with rooftop canopy solar PV for building in vehicles uh, produces a lot of extra energy and, and a lot of opportunity uh, to avoid running short. Uh, Jeff, the cost of extra absorbed can be absorbed in supplying direct air carbon CO2 capture. Turn it off when you're running low on inputs. In other words, if you if there is a shortage of of insulation or wind or both, then you simply turn off the uh, direct air capture machinery. And I've been thinking in terms of about 50% more than the world needs to operate to do the direct air capture and really accelerate bringing that down. Then um, hourly CO2 input goes negative. Um, and so that chart, the it can go a lot negative um, by having more provision of, of, of solar and more provision of batteries and more provision of wind. In the long run, the long run em emissions also go negative. Um, fast acting batteries can level out the time coincident performance on the minute to three minute range that somebody mentioned. And um, let's see, minute and to go. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, we expect to be doing breakthroughs in not only the batteries I've talked about for years, but also now solar and uh, once the solar and batteries are in volume production, then wind as well. We've got break. We've got technologies for that. The impact, the the offer. The, it's not an offer yet, but what I'd like to put forward is what I'm thinking about for Peninsula Clean Energy and the other CCAs, is e having a choice of either lower cost purchases of equipment and actually actually taking delivery of the equipment and having and owning it or uh, or having us set up a service you know like sustain you know energy as a service basically and uh, sell those things I think we'll be able to undercut the uh, price of the market so significantly and I also think that we can if we're, we we should get to a point where we can finance our customers which means that people wouldn't have to look at negative cash flows in order to get started. I guess I should stop there. Okay, thanks, Mark. Bruce. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment to try to bridge between this most recent presentation and the one that's coming up next. Um, but before I do that, I would like to ask if it's possible for the modeling team to share um, their methodology, their models with the other 20 CCAs, because I really don't think any other CCA has a team that could do what you all have done. And now that the models have been tested and you know tweaked, um, perhaps other CCAs would be able to make different decisions about their procurement if they uh, were able to run these models against their load shapes and cost constraints. But the main comment I wanted to make was sort of a thought experiment where one would contrast uh, PCE's greenness of its energy and its cost of electricity versus SMUD. Um, SMUD's electricity is much, much less expensive, and one of the consequences of that inexpensive electricity is that the pace of building decarbonization is moving much more quickly there because the financial benefit of going from gas to heat pumps is very, very clear and compelling in SMUD's economic case. So how might PCE be able to become more SMUD-like? Well, one way, I don't know quite how you do this, but it would be to have a larger fixed monthly charge, say 30 to $50 a month, and a much, much lower cost per kilowatt hour. And I'm thinking of residential rate cases uh, in particular. Uh, when the marginal cost of another kilowatt hour is low, uh, then putting in a heat pump water heater or heat pump HVAC system or an induction cooktop becomes a much simpler thing to do. And even if PCE's electricity was only 90% carbon free on an hourly basis, if enough homes decarbonize, the actual GHGs emitted in PCE territory 
might be a lot lower than they would be if the electricity cost remained high and you achieved a 99% goal or something similar. Um, this is actually a fairly new thought for me. I've been a long-term advocate in, in Silicon Valley clean energy territory of a 100% GHG free electricity supply. Uh, but I guess I've evolved to a point where I'm trying to think a little bit more broadly and also recognize that um, EVs and building decarb are much bigger opportunities to move the needle than to get the last 5 or 10 percent uh, of the carbon out of the electricity supply in either PCE or SVCE territories. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we now have a five minute break between this and the decarbonization discussion. And I think that David is going to swell it, swear in Elmer as the Redwood City representative during that time. But all of us will take a five minute break. Right now it's 8.34, so we'll be back at 8.39. Yes, um, and of course, anyone who wants to stay and cheer on uh, Elmer uh, can certainly do that as well. Um, Mr. Martinez, are, are you here? Yay! <laughs> yes, I, I am. Awesome. Uh, hey, so um, you've probably done this before. It's, uh, it's the same gig. Uh, you're going to start out by saying I and then your name, and then you're going to repeat after me. So if you would begin by saying I and your name. I, Elmer Martinez Ceballos. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. To the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. I think there's a little delay between us. Did you say against all enemies? <laughs> Not yet. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter Yay, well done. Uh, you know, you can't, you, you think you couldn't make this any more awkward, but then you put it on Zoom with a, with a slight uh, tape delay. You know, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the joy of the, uh, hopefully the end of the pandemic. Uh, congratulations, welcome to the board. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have you. Thank you, David. And thanks everybody. I'm very excited to join you all and, and support the good work that you've done. So thanks again.
Okay, I think we're ready to come back. I yes, I may. I'd like to um, to uh, introduce the next uh, amazing presentation that you're going to see, focusing on our our second strategic priority, which is our 2035 decarbonization plan. And you'll be hearing from uh, Raphael and Philip and Blake during this presentation. Take Thank it you, away. Jan. Thank you, Jan. Directors, uh, uh, again, Rafael Reyes, Director of Energy Programs, I'm very pleased here to uh, present to you. Thank you for not only your insight, but your uh, perseverance uh, <laughs> through um, uh, a lot of substance here. Um, I believe uh, uh, Director Alps also wanted to offer some intro comments. Uh, we were very pleased to have uh, 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 participation from a board subcommittee and as well as an advisory committee and uh, Director Alps participated on both of those. Thanks, Rafael. Um, three quick things. First, um, there is a, I, I am awestruck by both the quality and quantity of work that went into what you're about to see. Um, what you're seeing tonight is the tip of the iceberg. I had the privilege of snorkeling around the iceberg to see kind of sort of how deep it goes and it goes really deep. So thank you to Raphael, Philip, Blake and, and, and the rest of the staff that supported them on doing this work it's, is, is very impressive. Second thing is the, the advisory committee that you, that, 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 that worked with this group um, is if you don't not familiar with the field, it's kind of a who's who of sustainability leaders in the area from the for-profit, non-profit, and government government sectors. Uh, very, very, a lot of star power in that group. They were also duly impressed by the work, and they rolled their sleeves up to make it even better. So I want to thank the members of that committee. Um, some of them I think are watching here tonight, and again, just point out that, that, that this this effort has been very high quality. And I guess the last thing is, you know, what we're going to see here, along with what we just saw, are you know, every day we, we get confronted with more and more evidence that the bill for fossil fuel usage is coming due. Um, efforts like this give me some hope for, for the future. So I just want to, I hope you, I hope you share some of that hope. And uh, I want to thank everyone who, who put, put work into making this product what it is. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Director Alps. Let me go ahead and bring up the slides and jump right in. Uh, so what we're going to do um, here with you is uh, provide first a, a recap of uh, the analysis uh, scope and, of course, some background on the project with a schedule. And then the next four items really represent the uh, draft plan. Um, some components, there are some additional components that are still forthcoming um, that will follow, and we'll discuss those in the next steps. And as Jan noted, I will be tag teaming this presentation with our program managers, uh, Blake Hershaft and Philip Kovernick, who are program managers in buildings and transportation, respectively. Uh, as noted already, of course, we're talking about our second strategic goal. Uh, I want to acknowledge again our distinguished uh, board subcommittee and advisory committee members. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but we had very rich feedback um, from the participants. Just some highlights here on this next slide uh, around rate design. So we had public comments earlier. We'll be touching on this. Uh, program design concepts like the one-stop shop for customers. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we had um, over 120 comments and questions that were received um, that substantively uh, inform the uh, strategy that you're going to be seeing here tonight. Uh, this project started um, with the uh, board uh, directive in September of last year and officially kicked off in December, where we established the schedule and scope, and then went through a number of the analysis phases, uh, and then culminating in this um, Q3 piece, which is really the core of the uh, plan, uh, uh, what we're going to be presenting to you here tonight and then a number of final refinements and additional elements will follow uh, the board retreat based on the feedback that we received from you. First of all, we knew that um, we were not in a position to boil the ocean. Um, we, um, one of the first things we did was take a look at the entire emissions pie 
um, of which buildings and transportation are the largest segments. And in this pie chart, buildings um, is all of the yellow, including the light yellow. Uh, and the blue is transportation, including the light blue. Um, and within those, um, uh, within that uh, emissions inventory, uh, we identified those areas that um, PCE is well positioned to have a substantial impact on, as opposed to other segments where other players are in a better position to, um, to act on. And the, um, with the board subcommittee uh, approval, we identified uh, private passenger vehicles and local fleets as well as ride hailing and alternative mobility as the primary um, scope within transportation. These should all be familiar. It's all work in progress. And then within buildings, um, small res what we're calling small residential, which is a combination of single family and small multifamily. Why those segments? Those are by far the largest segments uh, for emissions in our service territory and they have commonality in terms of the kinds of systems that are in the building uh, and ones that, again, we believe that Peninsula Clean Energy is well positioned to affect. There are other segments um, which we anticipate some involvement, such as office and small commercial. Those that are out of scope um, are uh, either ones that are not related to energy, um, such as land use and compost, uh, uh, and those things, those are still incredibly important. Um, local governments are playing an important role in those areas, and they're not ones that PCE is directly involved in. Um, there are others here as well that could be in theory within our scope, but really rely on um, either very, very deep, highly technical expertise and very narrow um, or already have very substantial involvement from other agencies. So heavy duty vehicles is a good example of that where um, uh, significant incentives are coming from CARB um, and other players are better positioned to address. Similarly, large multifamily, um, Bay Ren is already very heavily involved there. And we feel that um, um, uh, uh, focusing on small uh, residential uh, and private passenger vehicles against the primary elements here are really where we're best suited. So everything you'll see in this analysis relates to what we're describing here as the primary scope. With that, I'd like to invite uh, Philip to speak to the next piece. Great, good evening, directors. I'm Philip Kobernick. I'm our programs manager for transportation. So I'm excited to talk to you about all things EVs tonight. So this chart that you're looking at uh, shows the new vehicle market in San Mateo County over time. Each bar represents the total number of new vehicles that are purchased every year on average. Um, the brown is the gas cars and the green are EVs. The red line that you'll see is the uh, total population of gas cars on the road over time. And what you're seeing here is that we're doing very well for EV adoption in the new vehicle market. We're, we're really at the leading edge for EV adoption. Um, uh, I think we're among the highest in the nation. So we expect that trend to continue over time and be very high for new EVs, um, but there'll still be about 300,000 gas cars on the road in 2035, roughly half the on-vehicle fleet. And a major factor here being the limited number of available used EVs being a, or a constraint there. And another constraint is um, in the EV market growth will be the availability of charging, which I'll get into in the next slide. So that last slide showed where we are we are going with EV adoption, and this shows where we are now with EV charging. So there's a little under 5,000 EV chargers in San Mateo County. And to support an all electric fleet, the California Energy Commission estimates we need somewhere in the ballpark of about 70,000 chargers to make that happen. And you'll see that a lot of the charging here um, rep represents public chargers, a lot of them are workplaces, and very few currently in the multifamily sector. Now, this is really important because 80% of EV charging happens at home currently. That's where folks like to charge. And because there's so few chargers currently existing in the multifamily segment, 
that's where um, a lot of work is going to be needed and where uh, a major focus will be needed. Okay, next slide. So here's an overview of some of the con uh, conclusions in our analysis. I'll go through these briefly. In general, we have a relatively young fleet. Um, we have a strong new vehicle market, which is a, a beneficial thing for EV adoption. Um, on an our analysis also shows that EV adoption is highly correlated with income. But the two really critical takeaways here are that charging a multifamily is virtually non-existent. Um, that's really where we're going to have to put a lot of effort. Our reach code efforts are really helping, especially with new, with new construction, really. Um, but there's a major gap when it comes to providing charging at multifamily properties. And the next major takeaway here is that there is going to be limited supply in the used vehicle market. It takes a long time for cars to enter into that market. And for the foreseeable future, there will be fewer cars, for fewer used EVs rather, than people want. So there's going to be a major constraint there. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Blake to talk about building electrification. Hi, my name is Blake Hershaft. I'm the Building Electrification Programs Manager at Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, one thing I'm going to start with is a reminder of one of our big challenges. Residential rates are very high in PG&E territory. Uh, this graph shows the annual cost of running a water heater in a typical home. Uh, as Bruce pointed out earlier, at the bottom you'll see a SMUD. Green is a heat pump water heater and blue is a gas water heater. In SMUD territory, we're seeing about $150 a year in savings from going to a heat pump water heater, and that's true in most of the U.S. Whereas in PG&E territory, costs are roughly equivalent. You see the $222 versus $232 there. Um, next. If we could reduce PC, if PC rate reduction could help, uh, that would be useful. However, most of the rate is from PG&E transmission and distribution and non-bypassable charges. Uh, the dark green you see there is the PG&E generation rate as the portion of the costs. Uh, I, I think the, the thing we want to underline here is that changing uh, utility rate design is going to be a major policy need going forward if we want to see savings like SMUD sees. Next. Uh, we really wanted to do a deep dive uh, to, better, to better understand the ability of our customers to pay for electrification. We wanted to do a deep dive into the income distribution across the county. On the left, we have a number of households. Uh, the bottom, the x-axis here is uh, income household income per year. And the warmer colors are multifamily, while the cooler colors are single-family households. Uh, what you see is the income distribution here. Since we're focusing on single family and small residential, I'm going to jump to the next slide. Uh, this is single family, small residential. Green will be rented homes. Royal blue is owned with a mortgage. And then that teal color is owned free and clear. Uh, this is the breakdown in our territory. One thing to note here is that uh, you can't see wealth on this chart. It's only income. So there are some in the lower income category that might have the assets to potentially pay for electrification and some cannot. Next slide. Uh, we did identify a special challenge in the very low income homeowner category. Um, the, these, are, these are homeowners who uh, have less than 50% the area median income, and you can see them there. Uh, we think that a, a special type of project finance might be used to help uh, fund those projects, and, and we need to focus on them. We'll discuss that later. Next. Uh, so the major challenges, uh, as Philip had discussed, we also have major challenges on buildings. Uh, or our conclusions here, uh, we have an older small residential dominant building stock, a lot of buildings from the 50s and 60s. Uh, the total capital required to electrify those buildings is about 3.6 to 4 billion. It's worth noting that through regular maintenance of homes, uh, customers will already be spending a, a billions of dollars. Uh, the economics are expected to improve over time. Uh, and, then, and then three major takeaways here. Uh, high electric rates are a major obstacle, as I identified previously. Uh, there are potential air CARB and air uh, resources board and uh, air quality management district policies that are going to have enormous impact. And the low income segment really poses a significant challenge. So building on that, um, as part of the direction that we received from the board last September was to first uh, um, assess the feasibility of 100%. 
our conclusions are that uh, PCE can make substantial impact, um, but that 100% is likely infeasible given the um, resources and uh, rate structures and policies that we have in our field of view. Um, this, uh, these conclusions, we'll speak to them in more detail here in the next um, slides, do make a number of assumptions, which we'll talk through, including um, sta stable um, external funding, from state and uh, federal levels, uh, modest to moderate PCE uh, program budget growth, uh, and uh, really leveraging all the financial tools that we have available, including especially finance, which we'll speak to in detail. Uh, and our analysis assumes no rate reform. One of the central elements, of course, uh, to uh, our overall strategy is uh, how do we scale and, and leverage partnerships? We absolutely can't do this alone. Uh, so we want to speak to that first. Um, and I would note first that um, part of what we're after, of course, is really a market transformation process. Um, in solar, we're very familiar with that. That's well underway over 20, 30 years of um, improvement in uh, solar with dramatic declines in costs uh, in transportation. We're now seeing um, that uh, process happen um, with electric vehicles going into the hockey stick. And buildings, though, are really in the beginning of that process. Um, but looking at this just conceptually, we know that uh, there will be a small beginning um, where um, we are looking for interventions that help lower the costs, and that lower cost then helps drive an increase in demand. That increase in demand results to increased manufacturing, and then ideally that starts to create a virtuous cycle where costs are lowered further, increasing demands further, and again lowering the costs and further intervention might lead to yet larger um, scale and lower costs. So we really see um, Peninsula Clean Energy's efforts as the uh, tip of the sphere, if you will, in this process. We, of course, as noted um, earlier, need to engage all our prospective partners in this process. So here, just conceptually, a number of the categories of partners. Uh, we, of course, have the state and regional agencies like um, and the Air Quality Management uh, District, uh, we have local governments where we have active partnerships around local codes uh, and policies, uh, private companies where we're already um, engaged either on the innovation front with new technologies or with existing established companies to do bulk purchases and the like. Um, other CCAs where we do uh, extensive best practices sharing and partnerships uh, and leveraging of, of, of resources. Uh, most of these are already um, very active. So, you know, here's a small sampling of the kinds of uh, companies and organizations that we are already partnered with in one form or another. The one missing, clearly missing cog is the uh, financial tools and the capital providers. And that's an area where we see uh, a special need for further attention. We, of course, have a rich set of uh, local partners in um, San Mateo County and hope to build them further, of course, as well in Los Banos and the Central Valley. Um, but here in San Mateo County, um, we are partnering with uh, the County Office of Sustainability and with CCAG on a carbon neutrality action plan um, with a number of objectives to advance our shared goal. And that carbon neutrality action plan would encompass not only the energy piece that Peninsula Clean Energy is driving, but all the other pieces that are so important, as noted earlier, in transportation, uh, uh, composting, uh, a variety of other things that are very, very important in terms of the overall picture of decarbonization. Um, I'm uh, happy to report that we do have already initial successes with regards, oops, I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. Um, for replication, we, um, there are a number of steps that we already take. Um, we develop a lot of uh, methods and partnerships um, through the course of our programs. And that involves looking at technical methods, technologies, various tools, program models, policies, 
Um, we use those to then foster the early market to get the volume going, if you will, um, with the intention of helping to mature the uh, supply chain and workforce, and then push that out and replicate those uh, policies and methods with our peers, practitioners, and state agencies. And I'm happy to report that we have already a number of successes in this replication process. Of course, best known would be our building codes, where not only do we have 16 um, cities and the county that have adopted uh, local reach codes, um, but our move regionally on reach codes clearly had a substantial influence on the state code in the, in the current code cycle now going into um, effect. Um, and this program was replicated by a number of other parties, uh, including, of course, our formal partnership with Silicon Valley Clean Energy, um, but as well as our informal partnership with East Bay Clean Energy. Um, Clean Power Alliance is now bringing up a reach code program. Uh, San Luis Obispo piggybacked on, on our efforts. Um, so significant success there. And then uh, we also see that in EV charging, where our push on power management and level one charging was subsequently adopted by the California Energy Commission, PG&E, AQMD, although they get a hat tip for actually starting uh, somewhat earlier than we did. But Silicon Valley Clean Energy and MCE are all moving in this same direction. And we have partnered with a private energy provider, Clear Result, who provides our technical assistance. And Clear Result has been instrumental in also bringing that expertise and methodology to other regions. And then lastly, this is also true for a number of uh, our programs. I'm not going to go through them all, but there's very rich sharing across all of the CCA um, agencies. And this is a list of programs where either we have shared with another CCA who has adopted um, those programs or vice versa. Um, with that, we'd like to pause for um, feedback that board members may have with regards to, you know, are there particular partnerships we should explore or are there agencies that can provide uh, assistance? And of course, any other comments or questions that board members may have. Any questions from anyone or any comments from anyone on the board? Uh, Betsy. Thank you. I would just um, say we're very early in the process with the public-private partnership with Block Power, but it certainly seems like one that is worth um, keeping an eye on and exploring. And especially Absolutely. the portion that addresses the low income at, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I don't, uh, Carlos. Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation, Rafael and Gav. I, I think you're already exploring this, or you you already have some some relationships with um, the large MPO, which is um, in this case uh, MTC. But they they definitely have an interest and have been talking about, as well as ABAG, um, how they a sister enter this area. And I have suggested um, having sat on their or sitting on their executive board that indeed they have to reach out and have um, discussions with the CCAs who have been playing in this area uh, much longer than relatively speaking, than MTC and you know their and the funding sources they have. So I, I'm sure you have been through through Bayran, of course, um, which you're familiar with. Um, there are some relationships, but I think that there could be ways of leveraging um, some of their funds with some of our programs, or you know, perhaps having them piggyback on some of what we're doing, since they really are not um, accustomed to working uh, in this area. And and the low income kind of area sector is something that they are are certainly interested in. in figuring out how they can um, how they can um, make a, a dent in that. So I would suggest that MTC is one of those entities that you all should be talking about future collaboration with. Great, thank you. Okay. 
uh, Raphael, I don't see any other questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, the next piece here is what we describe as our financial strategy. Um, so this is where we um, uh, look, have built a financial model uh, around advancing our objectives. And um, this piece addresses a number of core questions uh, associated with the plan. Um, how much will the plan do in terms of number of units and greenhouse gases? Um, what resources are available? Uh, are there other value streams that we can capture? For, for example, demand response value. Um, uh, we also look at the role of policy, particularly on the building side to drive volume. And we apply various constraints to that, you know, how much total money there's gonna be, what can be financed, uh, and uh, from that, uh, it, we identify the gaps in terms of um, the 100% goal. What we're gonna offer here is a summary of that, but first we want to review um, or uh, provide the draft principles around which this financial plan was developed. And this is quite critical and I'd like to go through these individually and get comments from the board. Um, so again, these principles are the basis around which we built the financial model of which we'll provide some of the summary detail here in a moment. Um, first, we wanna make sure that we're leveraging market forces to the degree possible. And that includes um, in, uh, really applying innovation uh, where we can, uh, uh, as well as policy support. Uh, and with the in intention of being as cost effective as possible, hopefully to build market momentum. Uh, in keeping with the experience of other similar market transformation programs, such as the California Solar Initiatives, we see a need to have incentives be higher early and then decline over time as the market matures and hopefully costs decline. It may be necessary to provide more incentives than just cost parity, particularly at the beginning, to start that market process. We want to, of course, provide more support to those with less capacity to bear costs. And this is one of the central principles that we apply throughout the program designs. We also need to know that we, um, there are significant capital costs for customers. Finance is gonna have to be an important part of that. Uh, that may be both traditional finance. We have a rich capital market, uh, San Mateo County, it's easily $10 billion a year for home purchases. Um, but we also will need innovation to help drive some of the scale and to address some of the more challenging segments such as noted earlier in the very low income segment. We wanna leverage other existing programs um, and take a fill the gaps uh, approach wherever practical. And then we know that we need, not only do we need key policies, but importantly, we need programs to support those policies so the policies can be implemented and for customers to be able to take actions under those policies. So um, to paraphrase here, we see the programs playing a support role for policy um, to enable that policy action and help drive the market transformation. So let me pause here. Again, this is um, really key to the structure of the financial model of which we'll provide a summary and would welcome comments and questions on these principles. Okay, I, I don't see any comments or questions. Okay, moving forward then, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. There are a variety of assumptions in, in the model. Uh, we did take a constant dollars uh, approach um, we identified resources, again, from state and federal levels, including the newly adopted Inflation Reduction Act. We did assume that funding levels will stay constant, 
and that includes a renewal in most cases, both at state and federal levels uh, for these um, incentives. Uh, we also identified, um, uh, uh, as noted earlier, some uh, moderate uh, budget growth from a peninsula clean energy perspective, as well as other value streams. With that, I'd like to invite Blake to speak to the costs. Uh, when when looking at the financial model uh, on the building side, one thing to really important to identify is the cost to electrify a home. Uh, we really did some detailed analysis on this, feeling that the previous statewide studies didn't really capture the accurate costs. So we've looked at a lot of uh, different um, invoices from contractors and then data from different programs, including our own heat pump hot water program. Uh, the appliances we're talking about here, the most common single family home type in San Mateo County will have a gas tank type water heater, a uh, gas central gas furnace without air conditioning, a gas range, and uh, we'll typically actually have electric drying, but assuming it's gas drying, the cost to electrify is about $28,000 uh, if you do it right and get a fair price. Um, that's versus the typical gas equipment replacement cost of about $9,000. Uh, we do, I'm gonna go back one for a second. Uh, these costs can be brought down that 28,000 uh, or we see some of those being brought down through good design practices, technology improvements that are coming, including 120 volt appliances, uh, potentially bulk purchasing and improved contractor familiarity. Right now they're at, uh, some contractors are increasing prices for their first or third heat pump installs. Next slide. Uh, now, this graph demonstrates the potential rate of adoption that we can see, uh, which relies heavily on uh, the passage of existing building reach codes, the development of uh, in improved programs on buildings from Peninsula Clean Energy, as well as continued state and federal funding. Uh, on this chart, the y-axis is similar to Philip's earlier chart. The y-axis is annual home equivalent replacements. Rather than go through each type of uh, appliance replacement, uh, a home equivalent would be if one home, one whole home electrifies, or four homes each electrify a different appliance type. Um, <clears throat> in the early years, we expect existing building reach codes to drive adoption, and that's what you're seeing here. Uh, the colors here represent, I didn't explain the colors. The colors here represent brown is uh, gas reinvested homes and green is electrified homes year over year. Uh, after, in 2030, statewide policies will come through and we see much quicker adoption rates of electrification and there will need to be programmatic support for those policies. Uh, we expect reach, to, reach codes to continue into those years for two reasons. One, not all appliance types will be covered by the statewide policies. Um, and two, we really do, especially in the late 2020s, want to prepare for those policies, uh, prepare the market for those policies by continuing to pass existing building reach codes in more and more cities. Uh, by the early 2030s, we expect 10,000 home equivalents per year to be electrified in the county. Uh, similar to Phillips chart, the red here, if you look at the red axis on the right, that's total gas home equivalents at year start. And the red line, rather than being annual, is total. As discussed earlier, we believe uh, through the funds we see and the policies we see coming forward, roughly a third can be of homes can be electrified by 2035. Uh, given the policies uh, and programs we discussed in the previous slide, uh, we think it's really, we, uh, we need to ensure that people can take these actions without undue burden and that funding will be very important. Uh, these are the projected resources through 2035 that we see about 1.1 to 1.3 billion in resources. Six to 700 million of that in yellow is the customer spend. That's money that would have already been invested in gas fired equipment. 300 to 400 million is the state and federal funding, including IRA that we keep hearing about. And then the blue are proposed uh, PC incentives on the top, and then a low income project finance strategy, which we'll discuss more later in the teal color. All right, similar to 
Blake's uh, previous chart on building electrification, here's the financial strategy and value potential that we see for transportation, starting with EV charging. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, we have about 70,000, 67,000 if we're not including fast charging, the number of chargers that we would need to get to to support that all electric fleet. And the cost per EV charger, we're using $6,000. Um, and I wanna note here, that's actually three times less than PG&E's average uh, per port cost. And the way we're achieving these low numbers is through our power management and low power strategy to really deliver these charging solutions at scale. So the projected resources here are about 130 to $160 million getting to about 70 to 90% of the EV charging need, excluding fast charging. So that gets us pretty far, pretty significant on the journey there. And similar to, break, uh, to Blake's breakdown here, it composes, uh, the Valley composes several different um, areas here. There's customer spending, so like a co-spend co that you would pay or a match kind of payment for an EV charging, value potential from the low carbon fuel standard, incoming money from the state and federal government here, Load shaping, um, which is the value potential of load shifting EVs, and that's coming from the PUC that we're applying as a potential value stream here, and then of course PCE's investment. Okay, next slide. And so this it represents the value potential of vehicles, and there's about six hundred thousand roughly personal vehicles when I last counted. Uh, we think we can get to about 60% electrified in 2035 here um, through the value stack here. And some of the components that are included in here are uh, things like e-bikes costing one to 2,000 and used EVs uh, between 25 and 30,000 to electrify these. And that uh, gets a re uh, sorry total resources of 715 to 80, 70, 875 million. Now I do wanna add here actually, um, how, how important the electrification for transportation is, particularly on the low income here, um, because transportation costs are so high for low income residents. It really is a pretty critical equity component. And so the value of what we're talking about here is getting to 70% of low income residents having an EV or an e-bike, some kind of electrified mobility. That's what this is shooting for. And so this is really an equity program. Um, not net new EVs. And the major reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, we expect every used EV uh, to be purchased because demand will exceed, we expect it to exceed supply for so long. So this re these set of resources are about making sure that there's equity and access to used EVs, which again is really critical for the low income segment here. And so similar to before, these comprise of customer spending, load shipping value, state and federal, mostly in, in the form of the um, in Inflation Reduction Act in this case, and then PCE's investment. So there are, excuse me, there are a number of um, uncertainties associated with this financial strategy, similar to what we saw with the uh, supply side analysis on 24 uh, 7. There are possible risks associated with uh, external funding not being renewed. Uh, uh, if codes and regulations are not adopted um, at a rate uh, we hope. Um, other issues uh, include if we're not successful in delivering the cost reductions that we're targeting, um, we're farther along on EV charging on that and have higher confidence. On the building side, this is largely new terrain and our cost reductions um, targets are aggressive. Um, though we do um, believe that we will be able to make substantial cost reductions, there's still some uncertainty there. Uh, issues around supply chains uh, and whether or not they will scale to meet demand. Uh, and uh, of course, value streams, realizing value streams, demand response being the most significant one um, here and capital issues with regards to costs and interest rates. Um, I also want to flag here that we're not talking about distributed energy resources as part of this plan that we're presenting here, but they are still part of the program portfolio um, and just not spoken to explicitly here. So with that, um, we would welcome comments and questions around the uh, financial strategy. 
uh, and I won't uh, uh, read through the questions here, but these uh, questions would uh, be open to comments on or any other comments and questions board members may have. I don't see any comments or questions at this time, Raphael. Okay, thank you. Moving forward, um, the next section here is around program concepts. So the financial strategy lay, lays out the large dollar values, if you will. And here we step down to say, well, what are the key program elements um, that will be necessary in each segment? Um, so we have four major um, components here, building electrification, local codes and policies, transportation electrification, and then um, capital and finance. Blake? On the building program side, as we go to building programs 2.0, uh, we know flexible incentives are gonna be required and probably incentives that cover all appliance types um, and also cover broader building segments, including the commercial building segments. Uh, high touch support appears to be a, a big need. Uh, technical assistance or a hotline or maybe turnkey options seem to be important. Um, and then linking linking customers to finance is going to be important going forward. Uh, on bill financing or zero uh, percent financing is a, a good example of something like that that we're launching at the moment. Next slide. Uh, and integrate uh, really using programs to help backstop local policies is going to be important. Make no mistake, as we've moved toward electrification in the county, that has been that has been mostly driven by uh, the local reach codes that have been passed by people that are on this call. So thank you so much for that. Uh, existing building policies are going to be really critical to scaling the market and scaling electrification of existing buildings outside of just the deep greens. Uh, we do believe there are some measures that are some low cost measures that are ready for adoption today. Um, and that'll be helped by programs. For instance, next month we're launching uh, increasing our water heating incentive to $3,000 and launching an HVAC incentive that should make those measures cost neutral um, if a time of permit uh, existing building uh, measure is proposed as part of policy. And we're going to continue to build programs that can help support policymaking, uh, both for local reach code adoption and as state policies come online. And for transportation, the program concepts here are mostly a continuation of what we're already doing. So those would be vehicle incentives for low income, um, of course, load shaping, which we are getting into more and more, um, with EV charging, uh, technical assistance that uh, looks to scale charging and multifamily as much as possible. Um, a new area would be integration with single family homes and whole home electrification solutions, um, possibly including vehicle to home solutions. Um, and then more contractor engagement as we uh, look to scale these. Also fleets and alternative mobility, uh, which, uh, which again would be continuations of what we are starting and, and doing right now, local government fleets, small fleets, e-bikes and other alternative mobility strategies. And then one major element, as we flagged already, is around finance. Um, we know that uh, there are, for many customers, already options available, um, and typically homeowners who are uh, in a better position economically. Uh, they, uh, for these uh, customers, we are um, looking to provide more customer information and guidance around credit uh, credit options. And including bringing point of sale options to them to reduce the transaction friction, um, if you will. Um, I should have noted, of course, we are rolling out the on-bill finance, uh, which is going to be a 0% finance option and available to any customer uh, down the road. This could potentially be expanded to include third-party capital. We do see the need to work with uh, state agencies uh, to potentially bring credit enhancement, something that there is already work being done on by the treasurer's office, uh, and to make that more available for building electrification. But as noted earlier, we do see a significant segment of our population that um, cannot assume debt 
nor can they assume additional costs. And here is where we believe that there's an opportunity to innovate. Um, we already, as part of, as an example, in the government solar program, um, are, will be providing cities with a Peninsula Clean Energy Power Purchase Agreement. And one of the features of Power Purchase Agreement is bringing uh, capital um, which is often from a third party capital source, and then providing, um, delivering a service and costs, uh, of course, um, that, uh, uh, that the customer pays, um, but it's not debt and their costs are lower um, than what they would have been paying otherwise. We see this as a general model. Uh, for uh, building electrification, particularly in this um, lowest income segment, um, where PCE could engage a third party capital source to finance uh, pro building electrification uh, projects um, in a model where the customers would assume no debt and preferably little or no added cost. And uh, uh, through the course of standard bill paying, uh, for um, for power service, then PCE would use um, uh, would use funds to pay off that third party capital over time. Uh, so again, this is uh, under exploration, uh, but we see this as a prospective general uh, model that could be quite valuable in terms of addressing this segment. And here we'd like to pause for comments board member or questions board members may have around the program mix and features. Okay, uh, I have a comment from Carlos and then Colleen. Yeah, I'll make this fast. I know people probably wanna leave this meeting. Um, and this was really more related to the last set of questions about financing strategies. What about, thinking about actually buying down the rates on PACE funding for low-income folks so who own their homes. Obviously, it only um, you know, works for someone who owns a home. But um, I'm, I'm wondering if a rate subsidization program for some of the PACE funders would make some of this, um, uh, the, the, the electrification of homes potentially slightly um, less costly for folks um, you know, using the PACE programs. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Absolutely, that is something we intend to explore. Thank you. Okay, Colleen, and then Donna. Yes, I actually have a question. Um, looking at the electrification cost of residences, when you look at, I don't recall whether it was 20 or 28,000, for um, heating and thinking about the harvest thermal test, where do we project that's heading in terms of possibility of heating, space heating, water heating, um, becoming a reality? Is harvest thermal the only one that's that's producing this? Is there a chance that, that we can accelerate this with, um, further accelerating um, development of that type of equipment? And yes. would that significantly bring the cost down? And do we have any idea how much it would bring the cost down? We have uh, four pilot systems that are now in operation um, using the Harvest Thermal system. And for, for those unfamiliar with it, this is a innovation pilot, um, which uh, with a technology company that does both water heating and space heating with a single unitary system using a large water tank as thermal um, storage. Uh, and we see a lot of promise in that for a certain segment of the need. Uh, and uh, uh, we are now in data collection to evaluate all of the costs and the cost benefit. It does reduce the operating costs for customers. Um, and we're also tracking other companies that are also trying to do the same thing. So we're aware of at least three other companies now who are pursuing a similar strategy uh, and with all slightly different flavors. Um, but yes, we see uh, potential in that. 
um, although it is still remains um, expensive, but it can be part of an overall portfolio, which in aggregate hopefully will bring down um, costs. Okay, great, Donna. Thank you. Um, we were in an uh, CKG RMCP meeting yesterday and um, chatting about a few of these kinds of issues. And I think the one one common theme I kept hearing was the um, lack of um, kind of consistent, easy to access data on how all these programs integrate and mix. Um, because some of it is at the county, the city, Bay Ren. So helping figure out a coalesced way to amalgamate all this data might be really helpful. And another interesting idea, and apparently it was very, it's an expensive idea. It was like $10 million, but I, and I think it was maybe Sonoma or one of the Northern counties where they put together essentially a, um, a store type situation. I don't know whether it's online or actually um, a physical store, you know, where, where you could, um, everything you could buy in there was something that would electrify and electrify the home and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So stove tops, washer or dryers, um, you know, the heat pump, water heaters, everything, and people could go in and look as opposed to having to go into a Home Depot or other stores that have everything kind of mixed together with no one really understanding and um, knowledgeable about the products. Um, if we couldn't do something like that, I think we are missing an opportunity to maybe educate the people who sell these products in places like Home Depot and Lowe's, um, Costco, wherever, and help educate them and work with the local retailers to make sure that when people walk in, they know what to sell them. We're talking about doing that to the contractors and we're working with the homeowners, but the actual people selling in these stores, if we could convince them to sell everything electric, um, or educate them at the benefits, at least, you know, hopefully they'll, um, you know, we can get some conversion over there too. just trying to fill in all the little gaps. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the, that's great feedback. Um, some of those elements uh, we, we have already incorporated. Uh, we know it's extremely confusing for customers right now, even if you're knowledgeable. Uh, and so we do have the notion of establishing a kind of one-stop shop, kind of expert um, support to navigate. And also some of our peer agencies have already brought up online marketplaces. Uh, and that's something we will be looking at closely. And uh, the, the concept of uh, engaging retailers is also something uh, we can look at. Thank you. Okay, uh, Colleen. I would just add to that that um, maybe more outreach to contractors would facilitate adoption because there's a lot of contractors, they instantly will negate electrification because they're unfamiliar. They steer people towards the status quo and they're not going to come ask us for that assistance. We need to go outreach to them. So the more we can do in that regard will really help. Absolutely, um, that's very helpful, yes. Okay, uh, Betsy had her hand up, but it, it looks like maybe it's taken down. So. Uh, Rick. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, I just have to say that uh, I know I hear people talking about equipment, where to get it, who's carrying it, can we work with providers of uh, appliances and so forth, and where do we get labor? And of course, my comment is still the same, which is there are actual people who are trained and, and apprenticeship training programs who are training to do this work every day. So the workforce exists. What's missing is the demand. Uh, industry always adapts to the demand. If we can induce demand, if we can get cities to pass reach codes that say that, well, by this date, and here's a plan to get there, as we are trying to do in San Mateo, um, we have a plan to start uh, uh, um, requiring changeover upon burnout or replacement of gas burning equipment in 2025 and to be actual, absolutely finished with natural gas in San Mateo by 2030, this will induce demand. And industry always responds to demand by providing supply. So uh, I say that we need to help cities 
who are taking a leadership approach to this and seeking earnestly to do it soon in response to what we're hearing the uh, um, United Nations say uh, and um, reports that we're seeing on our TV daily about what's going on in the world. So I think that um, uh, we need to actually be um, very working very hard to make sure that we're working with our legislators, local legislators uh, in cities, but also at the state level and our federal representatives to get the money that the state and the federal government has said is coming here as soon as possible and then have plans to put it to work right away. If people want heat pump water heaters and uh, heat pump uh, furnaces, the Home Depot will carry them. But right now, not enough people are asking for them. So those are my comments, thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I don't... I see Director Nash. Uh, oh yeah, Betsy has her hand up. Go ahead, Betsy. Thank you, Rick. Um, so just first of all, to echo what Rick Vanilla said, um, whatever we can do to help cities especially work together to get some of these reach codes passed. If I am finding it's more difficult this time. And we really, the more we can um, work with PCE, work with other cities and all um, together push, it will be helpful. Um, I don't know that I saw sort of the idea we had a, um, that SMUD is doing, I believe a 1-800. So if you have a burnout, that you just have, you make one phone call and people can actually come and help replace immediately rather than um, uh, tr having to work it out, um, which people just cannot do when they're in a, you know, emergency situation to get something. Um, the permit process is something which seems to really need some help. And I know you've got it on there, but just to emphasize, that I think um, right now, permitting for elect at least, I am finding in Menlo Park, um, permitting to get electrified is more difficult than with gas. And we've got to change that. Um, and we're working on it as a city, but the more we can get some leadership um, with PCE, I know you're working on it as well with us, um, the better. And um, just, Generally, um, I like what I'm seeing here, and the more we can do all of it, just really working together. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Raphael, I, I just say that clearly the elephant in the room is the issue of electricity rates, and you started with that. So, everybody should focus on that. The difference and the electricity rates that we have in our region versus what SMUD has for this kind of conversion is about three to one. That, that is almost insurmountable. That, that's just a huge issue. And we all have to work on dealing with that. So uh, that, that, that's a deal killer, honestly. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll get, We'll get the early adopters, but it's getting the mainstream to really make the conversion that's the big deal. And that's not gonna happen with a three to one difference in electricity rates between us and SMUD. We, there's got to be a change. Yes, um, and that is our, our number one item um, in the policy needs um, section. Um, so we do recognize um, that, um, I'm going to pause here, though, to see if there are any last comments or questions here on the program concepts. You know, I don't see any more comments or questions. So then moving on, we have identified a number of policy needs. And, and um, per your point, Chair DeGolia, um, improving the economics uh, in relation to rates is our top uh, policy need. Uh, as we noted earlier, we, we PCE uh, have some um, influence directly, but it's relatively modest. And it's really the trans uh, transmission and distribution rates that are really um, the driver here for the poor economics. 
there are a number of concepts that a number of parties are developing, inc including what's known as marginal rates. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go deep on that, except to say that uh, incremental, under this concept, incremental new load for electrification would be applied a very, very modest um, uh, rate that would be based on the incremental costs associated with um, service from the grid. Uh, and we see that as one potential uh, for addressing this um, uh, significant challenge. Um, we also, of course, as part of the overall set of policy needs, um, uh, have identified things that we've already discussed here in terms of the local and state codes, the AQMD and CARB um, policies, uh, which are gonna be extremely important. Um, we also know that capitalization of finance uh, is going to uh, play a key role uh, and continuation or expansion of the various incentive programs will also be quite important. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but again, rate design is our number one issue and then uh, with others to follow. And then there are some additional supportive elements here as well around uh, workforce, including transitioning the legacy workforce, grid readiness, and gas system where we wanna make sure that we're not continuing to invest in the existing gas system. All of these um, uh, policy uh, uh, priorities, assuming board concurrence, would then become translated into PCE's uh, policy platform uh, and come back to you at a later date. Um, but I'd like to pause here. I see there's a hand raised uh, with Director Ellis. Thanks. Regarding the rates, I absolutely agree that that's a key point. I will say one thing, and that is we don't have to be as good as SMUD to make things to, to, to spur adoption. We just have to be better than PG&E's gas rates. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 we can, I mean, there are things we could do to do to, to achieve that. Um, but but you know, like this marginal rates would be one possibility, but we do have to keep talking to to the legislators and the regulators about just the overall that rate that that rate climate because it's it is a problem but the goal isn't to match what smud is able to do but but the goal is really just to beat pg&e's just beat the cost of of installing a new gas appliance yes thank you um, uh, okay i don't see any other board comments or questions And we're uh, in the closing stages, if I might suggest that uh, we take up public comment at the end of, of the slides and we're, we're getting that. Uh, so uh, the, the, the last slide, as a matter of fact, here now are the next steps. Um, we're of course taking uh, feedback from the board. Um, we will incorporate that feedback into the plan. And our intention is to come back to the board with some additional final elements. Um, that would be a program roadmap that would lay out uh, program concepts over time. Uh, the marketing plan of which um, board members have seen elements of that from the marketing department, as well as more on partners and metrics. And as we noted, the policy platform would also come back um, with further detail. And our intention is to come back to the board uh, in the first quarter. Great. Are, are, are there any questions from members of the board member on the board? Okay, I don't see any. And if there's any public comment, now would be a good time to make it. Uh, Diane. Good evening. I'll be very brief because of the late time. Um, let me turn. There we go. All right. My name is Diane Bailey. I'm with a community climate action nonprofit called Menlo Spark. And I was also part of the advisory committee for the feasibility analysis and the plan for 2035 decarbonization. I just wanted to thank PCE for the opportunity to be a part of the advisory committee and also really to commend staff for the extensive analysis and data here. It's, it's really quite impressive. Um, I also wanted to encourage PCE to consider this analysis as part of an ongoing strategy to explore how to reach zero carbon by 2035. With all of the data and analysis here, 
I think we really need to reframe the question from one of can we achieve zero carbon by 2035 to one of how will we reach zero carbon by 2035. We surely can. PC has a large suite of programs already that are extremely helpful. Um, and the analysis presented here today shows how we can get part of the way there, um, but also ask the question what further intervention is needed. And so I hope we can really focus on working together to explore those interventions and to really stake out a plan that, that uh, commits to zero carbon by 2035. Um, Mayor Nash already gave the example of a public-private partnership with Block Power and the city of Menlo Park. And I just wanna raise that up as a really novel strategy of how to leverage outside resources, commercial resources to work together with our cities and the county um, and to really accelerate deployment of electric appliances and, and electric vehicles. Um, and I really hope that PC can explore centralized assistance programs um, in addition to the public-private partnerships um, and really maximize the carbon reductions and accelerate a phase out of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Um, just knowing that San Mateo County is exceptionally vulnerable to climate change and also that continued use of fossil fuels is harming our health. Um, this should really motivate us to further act as quickly as we can to support and fast track both city and county electrification measures, as well as exploring novel partnerships. I hope we can get creative and work together. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Diane. Uh, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, fleet turnover will skyrocket with systematic conversions. Um, charging infrastructure at most buildings, um, solar stationary storage and energy management and smart microgrids to cover building and vehicles and finance to pay for itself in a few years with uh, no net negative cash flow by making the finance payments equal to or less than the savings then free energy and transportation, million mile motors, um, is what happens after the financing is paid off. Conversions will, it, when that happens, when people are seeing that, conversions will become a land rush. Um, no net negative cash flow financing. Okay, can and a thing for space heating, can solar space heating, which is literally beer can solar from Newfoundland. Um, $2,500 to $5,000 to heat a home, and that's in Newfoundland. And um, H2 water heat storage, I was actually in SolarTech International in the 80s, and we were selling uh, lar extra large storage, water storage, hot water storage, tied with the solar, with the water heater. Um, the cost of the valving was prohibitive. Uh, when the competition came in at $3,000 and we were at $5,000, we, ju we just shut down the company basically. That was also when the credit tax credits went away. So, but it, it is a viable approach, but you may find that, um, that simply electric heating and electric induction stoves and all that uh, with plenty of solar on the roof to cover both the vehicles and the building is enough. And one thing people don't realize is that when you have, when you get a conversion and you got a million mile motor going in and a million mile battery, the motors are already here and we'll have the battery soon, then your car isn't gonna need the maintenance and you aren't gonna need to have the overhauls and you aren't gonna need to replace the vehicle every so many years. Um, so that vehicle suddenly becomes far more valuable and the conversions can be done very efficiently with a systematic approach that I can discuss at another time. Period. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, Bruce. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being able to come in again. Thanks for your patience and thank you also for the excellent staff work. You know, it's, it's a bit of a pity that throughout this four hour workshop, we haven't heard the voices of any young people who will be suffering from whatever climate crisis exists in the year 2100. 
but they're not here, so let me see if I can speak on their behalf. Um, they would ask for the fastest possible conversion to a carbon-free future. Um, they would say that since the uh, costs of climate change will largely fall on their generation, it's only fair that the expenses of the conversion fall on the generation that I'm a part of and that all of you are a part of. The Citizens Climate Lobby in San Mateo County is also a well-organized, powerful group who hasn't spoken tonight. Um, but of course, their goal is to have a carbon fee and dividend so that those who use a lot of carbon pay a lot of fees and the dividend goes to those who don't use a lot of carbon. Um, so perhaps PCE could take advantage of this notion of a social cost of carbon in the rates that they charge for homes that either fully or partially electrify. So for example, if a home that had uh, four tons of carbon per year uh, from their gas appliances all of a sudden became fully electrified, and if the social cost of carbon were $100 a ton, then perhaps PCE should pay that ratepayer, homeowner, family, uh, $400 a year for at least as long as we live in a society that doesn't have a federal social cost of carbon through a carbon fee and dividend. Uh, in addition to those upfront incentives, uh, you know, over a period of 10 years at $400 a year, that's $4,000. I think a lot of people would say, I guess I better get on with it. I guess I better decarbonize. Let's buy that heat pump water heater. Let's get that induction cook cooktop. Um, it's just an idea that I don't think the staff talked about. Maybe they thought about it, but I'd like you to consider it uh, because I think tying rates to the damages that carbon does to the environment might help some people move toward taking the step of changing their home to be more sustainable. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other public comment. Uh, I think this is the end of this item. And the next item and the last item on the agenda is board member reports. And we are absolutely gonna be done by 10 o'clock. Uh, if anybody has a report, please speak out. I don't see anyone, so we are definitely done by 10 o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Wait, oh, wait, wait, I see a hand up there. Wait, no, Tiger Gas, go ahead. I'll be very, very quick. I just want to report to you all that Fog Fest is going on in Pacifica this weekend, and I'd like to invite you all to come and have some good food, some good music, see some art. Great, thank you. Absolutely thank you. appropriate. Anybody else? We know we have lots going on. We're moving into the fall. Uh, hopefully the weather will stay cool. And thank you all for hanging in here for more than four hours tonight. It was, it, it was a long but important uh, discussion. Thank you to the staff for all the hard work that you guys did on putting this together. It was really significant. Uh, and we will see you next month at the October board meeting. Take care and good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night.